Good morning to everyone. Welcome to session three of our 2020 Filipinas Conference. I also would like to welcome not only the 317 registered participants for today's uh, session, but also would like to welcome my colleagues from the Bauer Group Asia, led by its founder CEO, Ernie, or Ernest Bauer, uh, and also our speakers across the region. And of course, our partners from media. We are partnering for this session with the FOCAP or the Foreign Correspondents Association of the Philippines. Allow me to, to start the session before I introduce our keynote speaker to reflect on what we have been tracking in the Institute for nearly a decade with our partner scholars, residents, and non-resident fellows. Key to our Institute is how we have monitored through the years the regional security environment. We have focused initially on traditional security. But the pandemic really opened their eyes to the importance of non-traditional security. And given things changing in this, you'd say volatile, uncertain times, or in the age of what some would say unthinkable age, still we also focus on emerging security threats. When this session was being conceptualized by my colleagues in the Institute, it reminded me of what I wrote about uh, the greatest threat that we are encountering right now when I was asked to, to give the opening remarks or the welcoming remarks in the book launch of our colleague in Bauer Group Asia, Mary Hybert, where I said China's emergence as a political and economic power has come with growing ambitions, including the attempt to position itself as a global leader and shape the international order. However, its rise is far from peaceful with its questionable economic initiatives and aggression in the West Philippine Sea for the past few years. Given this critical juncture, China is in today, its foreign policy direction will dictate the country's global standing in the coming years. But I myself, through the past few years, have argued that we should not be drawn into this great debate of great power politicking. This uncertainty in the global order is heavily influenced by the unique characteristics of China's rise. Its calculative approach in navigating to the current order versus the nature of hybrid tactics where it exploits vulnerabilities through the strategic and opportunistic employment of its power and influence. The excessive focus placed on the strategic competition between the US and China has undermined the role of other states in the region. From a broader perspective, these are two powers within a regional system made up of middle to smaller powers whose stake and interests are just as substantial. The Indo-Pacific states have an equal, if not greater, impact on how the regional order will be shaped because of their significant political, economic, military, and social cultural power. And I remember having this type of conversation with my friend Ernie Bauer uh, more than a decade ago, and I used to visit him in Washington, D.C. The importance of middle power, the importance of ASEAN. I got his, my lessons uh, from him there. So allow me also to quote a policy brief that we published just this month, where I argued middle power countries should realize that even if the US presence in the Indo-Pacific is crucial to ensure a rule-based order, the region's future should not be dictated by or chartered under a unipolar hege hegemony. As the region's political landscape continues to evolve, there's a crucial need for middle powers to recognize their role and the importance of creating a network of like-minded states with shared values, of course, of democracy or rule-based law, 
to protect and maintain an open and multipolar Indo-Pacific region. Just two weeks ago, after the elections in the United States, I wrote about this in, the, in my regular commentary with the Philippine Daily Inquirer. And I'd like to end with these welcoming remarks that the current global disorder with the rise of evolving security threats in both traditional and non-traditional spaces demand that the region utilize effective multilateral collaborations among strategic partners and allies. Again, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us. And allow me to introduce our keynote speaker, the Secretary of National Defense of the Philippines, Secretary Delphine Lorenzana. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm honored to join you as the keynote speaker of the Filipinas Conference 2020. And I thank and congratulate the Stratbase ADR Institute, especially its founder and managing director, Mr. Dindu Manhit, and its partner, the Boer Group Asia, for this very important initiative. For today's defense and security session titled Philippines and the Indo-Pacific, Responding to the Emerging Regional Political Security Environment, our first set of speakers will discuss the new Indo-Pacific the strategic role of middle powers. The second part will be about developing capabilities against emerging security threats. The closing remarks will be given by the illustrious former Associate Justice Antonio Carpio. First, let us do an environmental scan of the Indo-Pacific region to see what is happening that may have some bearing on future developments. On the political side, the whole Indo-Pacific region is stable, except for the peaceful change and leadership in Japan and New Zealand. Recently, no other leaders are changing soon. It may be a year or two when some countries will have their elections. All countries in the region have been affected by the coronavirus, and a lot of efforts and resources are being devoted to fight it. Typhoons have likewise visited the region the Philippines bearing the brunt of several strong ones in recent weeks, destroying billions worth of crops, properties, and infrastructures. International terrorism has been silent or inactive, but it does not mean that it will not strike again at an opportune time. Transnational crimes continue. Illegal drugs continue to cross borders. Of all the challenges that the region is experiencing at the moment, the most important is the coronavirus pandemic. It has not only slowed down the region's economies to almost stand still, but it has also upended our way of life. Most malls and restaurants are still closed or partially open, but the pandemic also forced us to innovate and adapt. Online commerce and online banking increased more than tenfold. Telemedicine and online education has been adapted with amazing results. Video conferencing has also took off. The home food deliveries have never been better. The increasing use of internet to do business will remain with us even after the pandemic, and it will affect a lot of traditional jobs. But the downside of the pandemic is the disenfranchisement of the daily wage earners, such as laborers, street vendors, and others who suddenly lost their jobs and may never get them back again. They are the sectors that will need assistance from the government. There are rather big challenges are brewing in the horizon. In my speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue two years ago, I mentioned two perfect storms that may hit the region in the near future, and it is but right and prudent that we prepare for them. The first is closely connected to the internet technology. It is automation. According to a World Bank study, tens of millions of manual laborers will lose their jobs to machines in the next couple of decades, if not sooner. What will we do with these unemployed people? The other perfect storm is the effect of climate change. It is estimated that as the polar ice caps melt due to warming weather, 
the oceans will rise and small islands and low-lying coastal communities in the region will be submerged underwater. Moving millions of people affected by the rising seas will be a huge security challenge. On border conflicts, the region has been generally stable except the skirmishes between the Chinese and Indian forces in the disputed area in their boundaries near Ladakh lately. The Korean Peninsula is likewise currently stable. However, South Korea mobilized its forces when the North Koreans suddenly massed some forces near the demilitarized zone recently. Both sides have stood down since then. But the security concern that has occupied the interest and time of the security agencies in the region is the rising tension in the South China Sea between the two superpowers. This then is the crux of the security challenge in the Indo-Pacific region, the looming confrontation of U.S. and its allies and China over the South China Sea. While the U.S. and China continue to assert that their actions are defensive, the danger of miscalculation is ever-present, like the near collision of two frigates belonging to the U.S. and China two years ago. The recent decision of the Chinese government to arm the Coast Guard vessels patrolling the South China Sea has upped the ante even more. And if ever a shooting war happens, Philippines, which is right smack in the middle of this conflict, will be involved whether she likes it or not. China likewise bristles at the participation of other countries in the U.S.-led patrols in the South China Sea. These same countries have also come out with public support to the arbitral ruling favoring the Philippines to the chagrin of China. To illustrate how important the South China Sea is and the crucial role of the Philippines in the region, I got personal calls and personal visits from the Defense Minister's Secretary of Six Nations in the past five months. Minister Taro Kuno of Japan, 12 May, by a phone call. General Wei Finghe, Defense Minister of China, 20 May, phone call. Minister Linda Reynolds of Australia, 21 May, video call. Minister Florence Parley of France, 09 June, phone call. Secretary Mark Esper of the U.S., 12 June, phone call. Again, General Wei Fenghe of China, 11 September, personal visit. Minister Linda Reynolds of Australia, 22 October, personal visit. Minister Nobu Kishi of Japan, 23 October, video call. The two topics that dominated the discussions were, first, the COVID pandemic, and second, the South China Sea, with the South China Sea taking a large share of time. What do this tell us? That the South China Sea is important to a lot of nations. That the tension in the South China Sea will continue to rise as China will continue to accuse the U.S. and other nations of provocation and destabilization in the region. That the West is trying to contain the rise of China. China has consistently stated that the South China Sea is their core interest. And where is the ASEAN in this superpower rivalry? Despite its avowed ASEAN centrality, it is anything but. The ASEAN could exert considerable influence on issues and events in the South China Sea if only it could act as one. But this is not possible at the moment due to conflicting interests. The 10 ASEAN member states could not even agree to a common communique during a summit several years ago. Complicating the matter is the Chinese preference for bilateral dialogue as against a multilateral one. What should the Philippines do in the face of this rising superpower rivalry and complicating matters even more with the participation of some middle powers? A lot of suggestions have been put on the table on how the Philippines should navigate this complicated situation. Both the U.S. and China continue to woo the Philippines to the side. Everyone knows what President Duterte did to move the country closer to China. Some say it is good for the country, some say it is bad. Hopefully, the succeeding speakers can offer concrete and doable proposals and recommendations. In closing, 
May I narrate to you two instances during the bilateral meetings between President Xi and President Duterte. The first instance was during their bilateral meeting in 2017 when the issue of the South China Sea came up. President Xi said, Mr. President, I don't think we will see the resolution of this issue during our lifetimes. Maybe our grandchildren will have better ideas to resolve it. The second instance was in 2019 when President Duterte invoked the arbitral ruling saying that it is final, executory, and non-negotiable. President Xi simply said, but Mr. President, we also claim the area. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you all a very productive and cordial conference. Great. Thank you very much to Secretary Lorenzana for his candid overview of the Philippines domestic and external challenges, which lays the foundation for our discussions today. I wanted to start by thanking the Albert Del, Zara, uh, Albert Del Zara, Rosario Institute and my Bow Group Asia colleagues for allowing me the privilege of moderating our first discussion of this morning or this evening, depending on where you are in the world. The topic of today's discussion is the strategic role of middle powers. In Asia today, middle powers from the established to the rising middle powers have to contend with a regional order in flux. Ideologically, China's authoritarian challenge to the liberal democracies have tested the norms and institutions that have shaped the region since the end of the World War II. Intensifying competition over regional order between the United States and China is leaving many middle powers seeking to hedge their security and economic interests. Some middle powers have even found themselves in direct confrontation with China, as mentioned by the secretary, notably over unresolved territorial disputes that sparked standoffs with India in Doklam and Japan in the East China Sea, or even Australia as it seeks to investigate and address China's interference in its domestic politics. This trend towards fragmentation in the Indo-Pacific region is countered by deepening integration. Institutions like ASEAN and APEC, as well as arrangements like the reinvigorated quadrilateral security dialogue tell the story of a region where countries, especially middle powers, can and are playing an important role in building the regional architecture. Perhaps the most notable steps in regional integration in recent years is on the trade front with the Japan-led uh, CPTPP and the recently signed RCEP agreements. Furthermore, we're seeing that policies and approaches of individual countries, such as India's Act East policy and Japan's own Indo-Pacific strategy, further creates momentum and opportunities for deepening interregional ties and connectivity. These actions reflect both the agency of middle powers and their willingness and ability to shape the region's future. Given this very dynamic political and security environment, this panel today aims to discuss the increasing role of middle powers in the region and the possibility of fostering stronger strategic partnerships beyond the US-China competition, and of course, where the Philippines fits into all this. This discussion is especially timely with the political developments in Japan with the newly inaugurated uh, Prime Minister Suga, the US with its transition to a Biden presidency, as well as the continued impact of the global COVID-19 pandemic. So to kick us off today, we have Liz Durr, who will be making her presentation on the South China Sea. Um, by way of background, uh, Liz is a CEO and founder of Similarity. Um, and as the CEO and founder, uh, she has grown Similarity into an award-winning AI software company that automatically analyzes multispectral and SAR satellite imagery, such as those in the South China Sea. Uh, Similarity provides AI-derived insights for a variety of monitoring needs. Liz is a 30-year veteran of the Silicon Valley, congratulations, Liz, an award-winning entrepreneur and software developer uh, with customers in the federal government, uh, GIS consulting companies, and international defense and intelligence agencies. Very fortunate to have you here, Liz, and please do kick us off. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Tiffany. Let me share my screen here. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how we use AI to detect changes in the West Philippine Sea. This is a beautiful image from the Sentinel-2 satellite of the European Space Agency of some of the Spratly Islands. And I just love how they look from above. Um, our software uh, is based on artificial intelligence and it helps you achieve your goals by identifying important activity from above. So you can be a force for peace, prosperity, and sustainability by safely illuminating illicit activities such as militarization, smuggling, deforestation, illegal dumping, and even encroachment. You can help stamp out corruption by proactively monitoring construction projects and other government programs to make sure you're getting what you're paying for. You can more quickly recover from disasters by identifying, classifying, and helping to triage the damage to buildings, critical infrastructure, and crops. And you can increase government revenues because you can collect fines and sell permits for previously hidden infractions. So we have recently launched a South China Sea Rapid Alert Service. And what we do is use our software, uh, AI-ADS, to analyze every new Sentinel-2 image of the South China Sea as it arrives. So every day we're getting imagery of the South China Sea. When our software finds an anomaly, we alert subscribers to our service about anything that we've detected and what that might possibly mean. So what I'm gonna show you here are a few of the things that have been in our reports and a little bit about how we do this. So the South China Sea is about three and a half million square kilometers, quite a lot to monitor on a daily basis. What you're looking at here on the left is a tile from the Sentinel-2 imagery, and we're going to look at Woody Island in the Paracels. So we're blowing it up a little bit here. Our software creates an anomaly heat map. Those are the red spots that you're seeing here. And from this view, it looks for anything that has changed and it highlights it in red. So it's looking at this from quite a ways away. And as we get closer and closer, um, we can see the anomalies that are being highlighted by our software on Woody Island here. And this is the 10 meter resolution that you're looking at now that is the free imagery that comes from the European Space Agency. However, we do have access to 50 centimeter resolution provided by Airbus when we find something that we want to look into. And so this arch that we noticed, this curved uh, road in the anomaly image, we decided to look further into it and get a higher resolution image. And what I've done is overlaid our red anomaly heat map onto the higher resolution image. Now, here are two views in high resolution of this part of Woody Island. One on the left uh, in February of this year and the one on the right from in August. Now on the bottom here, you see the anomaly heat map in the view that I showed you before. That anomaly heat map was generated in June for the June image, but you almost never get the low resolution images that we scan every day and high resolution images at the exact same time. So there's a little bit of a disconnect here. And that is why uh, here you see um, a trench in the August picture that does not show up highlighted as an anomaly. And that's because it did not exist in June when that anomaly image was taken. So we had our analyst go and highlight all of the relevant anomalies manually on Woody Island. And you can see them here in outline. There have been quite a lot of changes and I just wanna show a few of them to you. Here, um, they've uh, uh, reinforced uh, a corner of uh, their, their port here. Um, they've done what looks like some aquaculture and reinforced their entire shore here and put in um, this curved reinforcement. Here you get a little bit better view of what they've done to reinforce their port. 
And here is a new building that is fairly substantial um, that's right on the water. And we've also noticed an increase in airplanes. Now, I wanted to show you something that uh, <laughs> goes to show how good our software is and how important. Not only does it save us a tremendous amount of time so the analyst doesn't have to look at everything, but it finds things that humans can miss. And these anomalies here were actually missed by our analyst in the manual review. So AI ADS, not only does it save time, but it can really help backfill the human error aspect of analyzing imagery. So I'm gonna give you just a couple examples of some of the things we've observed this year. The Vietnamese have been working hard in the Spratleys. Um, they put a radar dome on Pearson Reef. Uh, they've reinforced and put um, defense related infrastructure on West Reef a radar dome on Namnia Island, and they've constructed two new platforms, one on East Reef and one on Allison Reef. The Chinese have been very active in the Paracels. So in addition to Woody Island that we talked about, there's new structures on Observation Bank and Drummond Island, Antelope Reef, some significant construction on Money Island and Paddle Island with a new tower as well as additional construction. And not to leave the Philippines out, they have built a new port and dock for Pagasa Island uh, this year. Another one of the things that we can look at from above is what's going on on the sea. We just looked at a bunch of the land in the South China Sea, but a lot of what's happening is happening on, on the sea itself. And here you can see a number of Chinese ships in the T2 lagoon near Pagasa Island. And we've actually been able to count them uh, this year based on imagery just like this, but sometimes it's cloudy and you can't get a good image. We can count them with radar. And so we picked up counting the ships with radar over here uh, later in the year. And they maintain a, president, a presence, it ebbs and flows, but it's something to be aware of. Also something that ebbs and flows is the Chinese Coast Guard patrolling um, Scarborough Shoal and Second Thomas Reef. These are AIS images, uh, AIS signals from ships uh, from February, but it continues on a regular basis. We are looking at suspicious ship activity, and this was one of the most interesting cases. This is all one ship, and it's a giant cargo ship, 105 meters long, pulling into places that are very small and don't have good ports. And it's meandering around and stopping at a lot of different places and spending quite a few days at certain small cities uh, along its path. This is very suspicious behavior for a giant cargo ship. And um, this has just happened in October and November uh, at 1115. Uh, is the latest uh, information that we've got on this ship. So um, quite suspicious. Here's another one. This one was in February. It's another cargo ship um, loitering for over eight days in that tiny little spot. And this one here loitering for more than three days, uh, just a few nautical miles from shore. To summarize what Stimularity offers, uh, we have secure software. It's being used by the US government right now and it's available to be installed on classified systems. We also offer it as a service. Um, it's available on a secure cloud in the Philippines or as a pay as you go on Airbus's Up42 platform. We create bespoke regional monitoring services. So you define the region and our software will automatically um, monitor that and we can help you decide how often, what kind of imagery, and what it is you're specifically looking for. And we've got our South China Sea monitoring service. Uh, we launched it several weeks ago. We already have a handful of reports up there and you can subscribe to it at Singularity.com. So we're pleased to announce that um, Strat-based ADR Institute will be hosting our reports on their website. 
I want to thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you today. And um, please, feel free, please feel free to answer and ask questions and tell me more about what you're doing and whether this was helpful or not. We're really looking to be useful here in the South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, and really appreciate that very detailed demonstration of all that you're doing to track claimant activities in the South China Sea. Um, that was a great start to our discussion. The South China Sea, I expect, is going to be come up throughout the discussion as we talk about it as an issue, not just in U.S.-China relations, but also as an issue that's top of the mind for many of the middle powers that we are discussing today. So to turn it over to the rest of the discussions, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ernie Bauer, uh, President and CEO of Bau Group Asia. Uh, previously, Ernie was the uh, Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asia Program at the Center of Strategic International Studies, where he is currently a chairperson of the advisory board as well. Ernie is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on Asia Pacific. Uh, he has developed and helped to build some of the core entities that, le that lead US business uh, policy and people to people engagement in the Indo-Pacific, particularly in Southeast Asia. So it's a great privilege for us to have Ernie kick off our discussion uh, with some updates on uh, US, the perspective from Washington. Thanks, Tiffany. I really appreciate it. And good morning, everyone. Please let me thank my dear friends, Albert Del Rosario, whose name is so appropriately shared with this strong institute, the Stratbase ADRI Institute, and Dindo Manhit, who is like a brother to me there in Manila. Albert is as selfless a patriot as I can think of, and not only in the Philippines, but anywhere. He's been a great inspiration to me and others. I appreciate you inviting me and for the honor of speaking today alongside Secretary Lorenzana, Justice Caprio, and so many other respected colleagues. And, and hey, uh, we're on the uh, eve of Thanksgiving here in Washington, and the news is good, uh, probably the best in four years. If you don't believe me, check, the jo the, check your stocks, check the Dow Jones index. It reached a historic high of over 30,000 here today. As Trump has heard the fat lady sing and his lawsuits are failing, the governors of the close and critical states of Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, and Pennsylvania have now certified that Joe Biden uh, was the winner in each of their states, um, making it clear uh, that he will be the next president of the United States. Uh, Trump's team have signaled that the transition will now begin. I guess no one told them that it was well underway already, but, um, but this is good news and it, it augurs for a, um, a smoother transition than, than perhaps we, we could have faced uh, had he dug in uh, further. Um, the good news extends to the Philippines and Asia. Uh, President Biden has begun to share his choices for key roles that will be important in Manila and around Asia in terms of economic stability, geopolitics, and security. His team will have to be approved by a Senate that will be led by the Republican Party if the January 5 runoff elections in the state of Georgia go to the Republicans. But if, if that is the case, uh, key cabinet roles in the Biden administration will need to be confirmed by committees controlled by the opposition party in our Senate. For the most part thus far, Biden and America's first female vice president and first vice president of color, Kamala Harris have chosen well, and it'll be hard for Senator Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans to turn away highly qualified and uncontroversial uh, experts, such as Tony Blinken for Secretary of State, Janet Yellen for Treasury, and she would be the first woman in that role and although the National Security Advisor does not need to be confirmed, uh, Jake Sullivan, who's been named uh, at NSC at the White House. Uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield will be nominated as US Ambassador to the UN, and Biden and Harris are likely to tap Michelle Flournoy, another gender first, for Secretary of Defense. So we're waiting on choices for USTR, Commerce, and other key posts. But I think these are a couple of the ones that will impact uh, the Philippines and friends around Asia. I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in Washington and how it, how it will impact Asia, how Washington sees Asia and the Indo-Pacific. 
So I want to talk on about a couple of things uh, that you can expect to be different uh, in a Biden in this Biden administration than we've seen under the last four years uh, of a Trump administration. And first, I think it's really important. It's important to me as an American, uh, and that's that the U.S. democratic system has been tested with real fire this time, and it's demonstrated its resilience and it continued ability to deliver a peaceful transition of power in one of the world's most critical countries. Second, and I'll borrow a, a phrase um, uh, from Ambassador Thomas Greenfield that I really enjoyed, diplomacy is back. Um, and that means that we'll see uh, less deal making uh, through sending emissaries uh, to, to countries and, and, and having countries in Asia send emissaries to Washington, th that'll be less useful uh, or will be less dependent on that. And there'll be more investment in process and understanding and diplomacy. Uh, and I think this will be a more productive uh, process. So think less transactional, more procedural. Um, chief among these areas will be, in, in terms of areas of focus, will be um, multilateral cooperation and coordination in the healthcare sector, specifically in a worldwide effort to manage the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Under a Biden administration, the US will look to build teams and coalitions and cooperate and not pursue America only strategies. A multinational effort uh, to address climate change is also high on Biden's agenda. Witness his naming of our former Secretary of State and former US Senator John Kerry as his climate czar. Again, uh, borrowing a, a phrase from the ambassador and multilateral is back. Expect Biden, the Biden administration to reinvest in Asian architecture and particularly ASEAN based uh, architecture and structures for economic security and cooperation, such as the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN US Summit and related fora, uh, which are not necessarily ASEAN centric uh, as like APEC. So more ASEAN centrality, uh, less America first. This is uh, as Dindo hinted to in his uh, kind opening remarks. Uh, I think this is uh, more fitting with the direction that Asia is heading in and America can be much more constructive uh, uh, with this type of posture. You'll see a return of middle management in US engagement in Asia. And what I mean by that is US departments and agencies will have assistant and, and undersecretaries, deputy assistant secretaries empowered to focus on Asia, uh, including uh, the Philippines and ASEAN I think you'll see less bottlenecking, uh, a more policy-based approach, more predictable um, outcomes. Also expect to see a great new US ambassador sent to Manila uh, along the lines of the traditional highly experienced career officers uh, or, the, or, or someone who, who may have left uh, the State Department as a senior officer under the Trump administration may be called back and is needed uh, back in the ranks of the State Department, but, but expect uh, a well-connected pro uh, to, to succeed um, uh, up such a person in, who is Song Kim, who has left Manila and, and been moved to um, Jakarta, as you know. Next, I think trade will remain challenged in because of domestic US politics. Biden wants to find the middle and govern for all Americans, he says. But if the election showed us one thing, that is that the middle of America is really missing uh, the middle ground. The country is polarized and Biden will have to look for practical wins. I, I know his team well, and there are folks that help write speeches like Defense Secretary Ash Carter's famous line in his first Asia trip as secretary, he said, I'd rather have the TPP than another aircraft carrier. It'll be hard to uh, join the CPTPP or the RCEP in the next four years because, of, because the Democratic Party itself is split on trade and the Republicans have become uh, more of an anti-free trade force than their traditional uh, free trade platform. Biden's trade policy will be 
more diplomatic, less focused on deficits, less transactional, and more focused on uh, uh, workers' rights, human rights, the environment, social and governmental issues. And to be honest, a lot of the companies, the uh, I think the world's top companies have also anticipated this shift already and implemented policies uh, to focus on these areas as well in secure and safe uh, supply chains. So I think you'll see some harmony there. Um, it will be a question about how Asia wants to engage uh, in those issues, but I think we'll, we'll make progress. It could cause some pain points in the bilateral relationship, particularly with the Duterte administration, but uh, I think that'll be well managed by a good ambassador um, and Indonesia uh, will experience, um, I'm sorry, uh, the Philippines will experience um, some issues uh, around uh, uh, questions around the human rights uh, issues um, uh, around the, the drug war uh, in the Philippines and, and other issues uh, such as uh, freedom of the press. And believe me, I, I say that uh, as an analyst <laughs> and, I, and I don't think the Americans can throw a rock uh, in, in some of those areas right now themselves. Uh, we are undergoing massive um, uh, change here uh, and, uh, and recognition of uh, inequities in our own society, uh, witness the Black Lives Matter movement. So um, with all due humility, uh, I'm just pointing out some of the things that I think you'll see um, more in the headlines than you have for the last four years. Look for progress around issues uh, and sectors such as healthcare, uh, technology cooperation, digital trade, cloud computing, uh, and data management. This is a big one, uh, particularly given that the United States and the Philippines uh, do have a, a treaty alliance. Alliances will be renewed if partners are willing. The Biden team will invest in renewing and updating its five treaty alliances in Asia. Uh, Biden's team believes these uh, relationships have been, in many cases, badly damaged. And, and those bonds with Australia, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and Thailand will be at the top of the list for, for Biden's Asia team uh, as they focus on um, what they view as repairing uh, the damage uh, done by four years of very transactional ideological uh, policy, or <laughs> I wouldn't even say policy, maybe an approach by the Trump White House. If the Philippines is willing now or after 2022, uh, the Biden and the Biden uh, and the U.S. would will look for chances to expand uh, investment in security cooperation, economic partnership, and deepening our strong ties across sectors. That would include preservation and and the fact that you um, Manila uh, preserved the Visiting Forces Agreement, at least extended it. Uh, is a, strong is a strong and critical move for presenting options and flexibility for discussions uh, under, the, under the Biden administration. I'd expect continuity and more careful diplomacy on the South China Sea. That doesn't mean a diminishment of US commitments to the Philippines free access uh, or um, standing up to uh, Chinese, uh, what is seen in Washington by many as, as Chinese coercion in the South China Sea but it will be strength with diplomacy um, rather than uh, just strength <laughs> and, and blunt words. I think the US-China relationship will remain very confrontational. Uh, rhetoric uh, um, and, 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 and characterized by competition, but that rhetoric will be lowered. Uh, I expect the Biden administration to be less aggressive on Taiwan more forward-leaning on Hong Kong, Uyghurs, uh, Xinjiang, uh, continuity on tough policy in the South China Sea, as I mentioned, much more emphasis on ASEAN and, a, and return to a higher le level engagement with uh, treaty allies uh, and ASEAN, as I mentioned. So uh, Tiffany, I know we each have uh, 10 minutes, so I think I'll wrap it up there so I can hear what others have to say. And I welcome the questions uh, of our colleagues uh, that they may have for this panel. And once again, as we prepare for our Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States, 
I'd like to say we have a lot to be thankful for with the outcome of our election. And uh, I hope the Philippines is recovering from a very tough season of typhoons, hard work ahead in both of our, in both of our countries, but with well-qualified and serious people to do that work. I think prospects are very good. Thank you very much, Ernie, and appreciate the, uh, the sort of outline of the contours of the U.S. policy towards Asia, as well as insights into the new incoming Biden administration and what we're likely to see on their agenda. Now we're going to pivot to perspectives from the Asia Pacific, starting with Australia. Our speaker today is Mr. Fergus Hansen, who is the managing director for Bow Group Asia in Australia. Um, he is also the director of the International Cyber Policy Center at the Australian Strategic uh, Policy Institute, as well as a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. Fergus has been at the intersection of public policy and business across Australia, the United States and Europe, working with top business leaders, governments, and within the United Nations multilateral system. Uh, today, he is going to address uh, the outlook from Australia uh, on the Indo-Pacific region. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Fergus. Well, thank you um, so much, Tiffany, and um, thank you for the organizers for the chance to speak today. It's a, it's a real privilege to be joining alongside so many distinguished speakers. And as Tiffany mentioned, I'm coming to you this morning from Canberra. Uh, where we've been experiencing a transformational few years for Australia and its role in the region. When historians look back at this broad period, I, I suspect this will be, uh, they'll look at these last few years as marking an inflection point in attitudes and policy, especially towards China. In Australia, there has been a seismic reassessment of the relationship with China. Uh, for a long time, the received wisdom was that China would rise peacefully. A whole generation of policymakers believed the economic liberalisation that they were seeing uh, all around them uh, would translate into political liberalisation too. They were the young officials when Nixon went to China, and it's only just now that the, the last cohort of that generation is retiring from public service here. As the Chinese Communist Party has pivoted away from the, its formal, former peaceful rise approach, there's been a wholesale reappraisal of how Australia engages with its largest trading partner. The old assumption that China would liberalize politically has been dropped. And I think one of the sort of um, funny things I think is that commentators often focus on the shift at the elite political level here. Um, but I think this has actually been the Australian people that have often been ahead of the political class on a lot of this change. A long running uh, longitudinal opinion survey in Australia, the annual Lowy poll, uh, found this year that trust in China is at its lowest point in the history of the poll, with less than a quarter of Australians saying they trust China to act responsibly in the world. A similarly low number, less than a quarter, say they have any confidence in President Xi Jinping to do the right thing in world affairs. Meanwhile, meanwhile uh, almost all Australians, 94%, nine in 10 Australians, want the Australian government to find other markets for Australia to reduce its economic dependence on China. And there's been a 27 point fall uh, over two years in the proportion of Australians who see China as more of an economic partner than a military threat. This dramatic change in popular and as, as well as elite opinions uh, towards China has led to a transformation in our approach both domestically and internationally. Before the shift, um, Australian policymakers, I think, were often were very highly attuned, maybe overly attuned uh, to Chinese Communist Party sensitivities. Um, but after this pivot, uh, things are really pretty different. Australia was the first country to announce a ban on high-risk vendors being used in its 5G build, which of course included uh, Chinese telecommunications firms. Australia passed legislation to counter foreign interference and recently charged the first person with alleged offences uh, that related to CCP influence activities. Australia has led efforts with the EU to have the World Health Assembly endorse an investigation into the outbreak of COVID-19 and we've been active in stepping up 
our engagement with the Quad and building out partnerships across the region from the summit with Modi in June uh, to the new defence pact with Japan uh, announced this month. The reaction from the, the Chinese Communist Party has followed the now familiar uh, playbook. Um, ministerial contacts have been put on ice. There have been verbal threats of retaliation followed by a range of countermeasures uh, targeting non-essential products and services, uh, at least from a Chinese perspective. Uh, there was a threat to cut foreign students and, uh, and tourists, which was largely symbolic given the COVID-19 shutdowns. And there were more substantive bans on beef, barley, wine, lobsters, cotton and coal. Um, more disturbingly, there's, there was an, arbit an Australian was arbitrarily sentenced to death. Um, and we've seen the government issue a, a warning to all Australians that they face the risk of arbitrary arrest uh, if they travel to China. These have been some of the, the biggest developments, but day to day, there's also been a string of public rebukes in both, direct both directions. The business community, which has the most to lose and is most directly affected, has reacted quite differently uh, than in the past, though. Previously, whenever there was a, a slight blip in the relationship, the, the community would, would be pretty quick to urge the government to, to repatch things uh, as soon as possible. This time, things have been allowed to, to run for a little longer. There is certainly a deep frustration that relations have become so strained but there's also a recognition that things are different this time round. It's not just Australia being targeted, it's uh, India, Japan, uh, our, our, our friends in, in ASEAN, uh, the UK, Canada, Germany, uh, the EU. Uh, they're seeing the wolf warrior public messaging emanating from the CCP, the increasingly, uh, increasing assertiveness and actions on the ground all leading to a realization that the, the old op way of operating has, um, has changed. But I'd say even with that, the strains in the relationship have now reached the point where there are increasing calls from the business sector to try and find an off-ramp. The unanswered question though, is what that off-ramp might be. So, so where to from here and what is the role for middle powers in, more con in these more contested times? The short answer is that there is no simple off-ramp for the current tensions. Um, just last week, we, the Chinese embassy in Canberra, in Canberra gave a, a few local media outlets here a list of grievances uh, that China had with Australia, including things like uh, the existence of our media. Um, none of these are going to be easy fixes. Australian government ministers have made overtures to try and uh, reset relations that have been quickly shot down. Um, and the constraints on both sides prevent an, an easy accommodation. The Chinese Communist Party uh, wants submission to dissuade other states from pursuing a similar path to Australia. But there's no way that the Australian government can politically walk back any of its major decisions. And it would be hard to imagine any fawning apologies coming from the government. There are also misaligned incentives. No doubt the, the Chinese embassy here in Canberra knew perfectly well that publishing its list of grievances would make any concessions from Australia even more unlikely. But there's clearly an incentive coming from Beijing to pursue a more uh, assertive wolf warrior style approach. So the prospects for a short term solution are not great. Um, most likely in my view is that the CCP will gradually accept that Australia uh, won't bend the knee and we'll see a gradual dialing back of rhetoric and relations slowly allowed to normalize. A circuit breaker that might help accelerate this shift is when the next country decides to push back and take some of the heat off of off Australia. Longer term, the optimist in me hopes that there is a realisation in Beijing uh, that they've overreached and that picking fights is a less productive and prosperous approach than engaging in a more stable rules-based order. Regarding the wider region, uh, the realisation that the CCP is going to behave increasingly assertively uh, is likely to drive Australia into ever closer engagements with partners in the region facing similar pressures. The Quad is one manifestation of this, but there will be deeper bilateral relations built as well with Japan, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines and others. And I'd see these relationships growing out into increasingly well-rounded engagements covering as many areas of cooperation 
uh, as possible from be they economic, military, education, people to people, uh, et cetera. One of the areas I follow really closely uh, here in Australia is the, is the tech sector. Uh, and that's one area where I'd see a, a large and an increasing amount of cooperation uh, taking place across the region, particularly in the context of some of the decoupling discussions uh, that we're seeing at the moment. And I think it's, it's ironically that ironic that these deepening ties and partnerships uh, just might lead Beijing to realize there is a more constructive way uh, to engage the region. Um, I might leave it there, Tiffany, but um, I really look forward to your questions afterwards. And, and thank you very much again for having me along. Great, thank you so much, Fergus, and really appreciate sort of the historical context of just how dramatic the shift has been in Australia uh, in recent years and how that has led to deepening bilateral relations and kind of and connections uh, with other countries in the region on both China and other matters of common interest. So we're turning now over to Singapore, uh, where our uh, panelist today is gonna meet Mr. Jim Caruso, who's the Managing Director of Bow Group Asia in Singapore. Jim has been at the forefront of economic diplomacy in the Asia Pacific for much of his career. Uh, before joining BGA, Jim was the Senior Foreign Policy Advisor uh, to the US Indo-Pacific Command uh, in Hawaii. Prior to that, Jim was the Deputy Chief of Mission and Chargé de Verse at the US Embassy in Canberra. Uh, he also worked as the Chargé at the US Mission to ASEAN in Jakarta uh, in 2019 as well. So we look forward to Jim's remarks drawing on his uh, breadth of experience uh, in Singapore and across the region. Over to you, Jim. Thanks very much, Tiffany, and it's very good to be here with this uh, distinguished group on such an important subject, uh, especially as the U.S. administration changes over. It's a great time to consider how this administration may deal with the issues we've been discussing, especially the South China Sea and the rise of China in, in particular. Um, so let me start off with who are the middle powers in this region? So sitting in Singapore, uh, it's clear to me that the, the ASEAN states look at ASEAN as adding heft and weight to their views. It also allows them to take positions sometimes they may not want to take individually. Uh, and what we've seen is things like uh, ASEAN trade agreements allow trade agreements for individual states they may not have been able politically to get through on their own. Thus, uh, RCEP is actually a pretty good example of, of some of that. Let's not forget where, where ASEAN began, which was an anti-communist league at first back in the 60s, but it quickly morphed into a, an effort and an outgrowth of the non-aligned movement uh, led by Indonesia. And ever since they've been work, working to uh, advance their interests without uh, being aligned to either the West or to China or to Russia or to anyone else, but in the words of Indonesia's foreign policy, a free and active foreign policy that has the interest of ASEAN always at heart and keeping options open uh, for the interests of, of the region. Now, uh, how does that manifest itself? One is uh, with the rise of China economically, more and more trade and investment is coming from China and with China. So that China is the largest trade partner for most countries in the region and for ASEAN as a whole. No one wants to change that within ASEAN. Uh, despite the fact U.S. investment in the region still dwarfs that of, uh, of investment from, from China, um, it's going to be a long time before Chinese investment matches that of the U.S. ASEAN wants to trade with everyone. ASEAN wants uh, sea lanes open. ASEAN wants U.S. presence in the region to continue. Uh, they, ASEAN does not like Chinese unilateral activity in the South China Sea. Uh, they look at the US presence in the region as a vital counterbalance. But for years, it's always been, what does this counterbalance look like? Because they don't want conflict for sure. Um, they want the US, as I was told the other day, over the horizon, ready to act. But from my time at Indopaycom, I can tell you while, uh, that is understood for credible deterrence, there has to be a presence in the region that's more than just over the horizon. 
And that's why things like the VFA in the Philippines are so important, why uh, the uh, treaty alliance with Thailand is so important and with Japan and Australia. Deterrence means uh, a country that's on the other side of the Pacific can still work to uh, have a credible deterrence to Chinese activity. What the Trump administration did by trying to be more transactional, as Ernie alluded to, is calling the question the value of the deterrence. Would there be a deal cut between US and China somehow that would abandon the principles of, of free and open in the Pacific, of open sea lanes? Um, that was never discussed in my hearing, but you could understand why the concern would be out there. And the question for the Biden administration is, can they regain that trust? I think they can, uh, but it will take things like showing up at ASEAN meetings, showing up at the EAS, which as we've just saw last week, didn't happen. It was the National Security Advisor showing up uh, while the President, Vice President, and Secretary of State were elsewhere. Um, it's a matter of building confidence. Secondly, as the US moved more towards a regional approach on things like the Quad with Australia, Japan, and India, there was initially a lot of concern from ASEAN that this was an effort to bypass ASEAN centrality, uh, which is a key, key component for ASEAN because this is what gives ASEAN its heft, that decisions in the region, ASEAN has a critical say and should go through them. Well, I think what we've seen is uh, a shift after the uh, issuance last year of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which basically calls for many of the same things that Japan, Australia, US, and even India are looking for as far as international law governing the region, including and specifically the UN Law of the Seas Charter. Uh, I think what we've seen in, uh, in ASEAN, despite some disappointments about uh, the ability of ASEAN to come together on really pushing back against China hard, that by hanging together on negotiating a South China Sea code of conduct and insisting they're not going to negotiate it bilaterally in any way, and by insisting uh, at the urging of countries like the Philippines that the law of the sea uh, charter of the UN be specifically included in those negotiations and referenced therein uh, shows a couple of things. One is that ASEAN as a unit has a lot of ability to push back, even when uh, individual activities say uh, in the Tuna Sea, it's only Indonesia that can uh, defend itself in the Tuna. Uh, as the Philippines has found, uh, it has some verbal support, but not much else from its ASEAN friends. Um, it really is up to the US and some other partners to conduct the freedom of operations activity to uh, make plain and clear that freedom of navigation will continue in the areas where every international law allows. Uh, I guess another question for ASEAN going forward is, in the Biden administration, will there be a demand for more uh, support for freedom of operations, freedom of operations activities, uh, verbal support, if not actual uh, military or other assets? Uh, and I think it all depends on what China's reactions are to a new administration, uh, progress on the code of conduct talks, and how the US offers to ASEAN states more access to its markets. Uh, since the US declined to uh, join RCEP, declined to join CPTPP, are there going to be new trade agreements of some sort to tie the US more closely to ASEAN in an economic angle. Uh, you know, you can't forget that China's share of ASEAN trade just keeps going up. Uh, alternatives are gonna be very, very important uh, for this region to, to uh, show that China is not the be all and end all economically. Uh, and despite their presence in the region, which will always be there and always be very important, that US as a counterbalance will continue uh, well into the future. Uh, so I think to sum up, ASEAN is the middle power in this region. And the ability of, of ASEAN member states to continue to uh, 
grow ASEAN as an entity to give it a louder voice in regional and world affairs is going to be uh, ever more important as we go forward. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Terrific. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate the nuances of how ASEAN sees itself and its role in the region. Um, next, we are turning over to Japan. Um, we have our speaker, Mr. Kiyo Aburaki, who is the managing director of BGA in Japan, and he is also a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Kiyo has an extensive background working for Japan's most powerful business organization. Uh, he joined uh, VJ following a distinguished career with a Keidan Run, where he most recently headed up the Federation's international engagement. He covered international trade and investment, uh, the defense and aerospace industries, information technology, entrepreneurship, deregulation, and data policy. <laughs> Um, that is a very long list. I think I think I got everything here. And uh, also, he played a leading role in developing and implementing the Kedan Rune's political strategies. So thank you, Kyo, for being with us today. And we look forward to your perspective from Tokyo. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany. I appreciate your know, very very kind introduction. And uh, and I'm I'm also so much honored to be to be a, to be a, to be, to be in a part of this very important event. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we have a new prime minister. And uh, when, where, one of which country, you know, new prime minister would be it first? This is noteworthy as an indicator, actually, what is the important diplomatic issue for the new cabinet. And for example, you know, the Junichiro Koizumi, famous Junichiro Koizumi, who became prime minister in April 2001, he visited first in Washington, D.C to have a summit meeting with President Bush. Shinzo Abe, eight years ago, when, uh, when, when he, uh, uh, no, no, uh, Shinzo Abe in September 2006, when he became prime minister for the first time, he visited China, you know, to see that the President Fu Jintao. This was to show his intention to improve the relation with China, which had stagnated in the Koizumi era. When Shinzo Abe back to office in eight years ago, his overseas trip took him to Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia in January 2013. And the current Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga, who took office in September this year, he chose, he chose Vietnam and Indonesia as a destination in his first overseas trip last month. Actually, this shows the strategic importance of Southeast Asia or ASEAN to Japan and to the United States, to the US-Japan alliance actually, which is an axis of Japan's international economic and political you know, strategy. On, the, on November 17, Prime Minister Suga received his first summit leader guest to his office in Tokyo, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Suga conveyed his hope for stronger bilateral partnership to realize a free and open Indo-Pacific. Agenda of the two countries should include joint exercise of Japan's sales defense force and Australian military, and collaboration for anti-COVID-19, and cooperation for climate change. I think these are very good agenda because two countries share the basic value and the strategies and the strategic interests, globally and internationally. And uh, this month, we have a very encouraging news in terms of the international economy. You know, as you well know, Philippines, Japan, and others, you know, participate and signed, the, and 15 nations actually, signed the massive trade pact to RCEP, which accounts for about 30% of the total world growth GDP, and 30% of its population. I would like to mention very quickly, you know, five very, you know, five points briefly about RCEP. First of all, RCEP is a good thing. I think, you know, RCEP will improve the international business environment and to contribute to more efficient international industrial supply chains. And more, probably more importantly, 
RCEP is the first regional multilateral trade agreement which China joined. The second, the agreement RCEP is not surprising. Rather, I was actually relieved with the signing because 15 nations, or 16 nations, I should say, kept 15 nations, you know, kept momentum of the negotiations. Actually, it took eight years, you know, to, for, to reach here. So such a marathon long, you know, negotiation finally produced the tangible result. I think this is very, you know, good thing. And I, I was so much relieved. But uh, in terms of level of realization, uh, liberalization, you know, RCEP lagged behind TPP. Compared with TPP, RCEP had smaller and narrower elimination of tariffs, lower level labor and the environmental standards, and RCEP does not include restrictions on state-owned enterprises. And then, for example, many old parts exported to China will be subject to tariff for uh, 10 or 10 to 20 more years. I think this is a very important distinction between the RCEP and CPTPP. And about membership, it is so unfortunate we don't have India in RCEP because of uh, I and many in Japan expect Japan-India cooperation could improve international business environment. And I also learned that, uh, you know, my colleague from Latin from India will say something about this probably, but I also learned that it is not realistic to expect India to be back to RCEP soon. So five things, last point. So we need to continue our effort to promote freer trade and investment in, in, in the Indo-Pacific regions. The importantly, you know, last say, several years, you know, we have acknowledged a very important economic, you know, uh, trend, which is economic and the technological aspect of national security are becoming more and more important. I think this is because the global economy and the global society are becoming more and more, more and more data driven and digitalized. Then what will it be in the next five to 10 years? How major economies in the world should compete and cooperate in terms of development of digital infrastructure, data use, R&D, and the production of advanced devices and hardware? These questions is already, are already appearing today. Probably I should say posed by 5G, for example, but this is just the beginning. We need to discuss to produce an appropriate framework of business activities in the more and more data-driven in the Pacific you know, region. And I think this is the core is close US-Japan cooperation and the US leadership. Why US leadership is important? You know, three reasons. United States is a, a, it's the world's largest economy. The US participation could produce huge benefit to the whole Indo-Pacific region, including the United States. And the second, the US is the leader of technology and innovation, which is the source of economic growth. According to the survey, you know, the conducted by the McKinsey, you know, semiconductor related R&D investment in last three years, average US level is almost 13 times of Japan's investment and uh, over 50 times of China's. So US is quite massive, you know, enthusiastically investing in new technology. And the third, since we need to discuss about technological aspects of national security, US participation is so relevant and indispensable, I think. You know, these kind of trade initiative should be clearly different from RCEP and CPTPP traditionally. We are not discussing about the, you know, traditional, you know, the theme of like, uh, uh, you know, tariff elimination, but we need to create a rule of how, it, you know, 
global company or company, major economy should compete and cooperate in a digitalized world for data-driven you know, situations. So my hope is new Biden administration in cooperation with Japan it will exercise its leadership to launch this new new initiative for more data-driven economy tomorrow in the, in the Pacific. And also in a private sector, I think BGA, BGA play a especially very unique role to make a, to create a blueprint of such an economic architecture and to facilitate concrete discussion to achieve the goal. And I'll stop here. Great, thank you very much, Keo. Um, especially for that useful reminder that there's still continued demand for US leadership, even as middle powers like Japan is playing a greater role uh, in regional architecture like CPTPP um, and like RCEP as well. Um, for next, we're gonna go westwards um, and to take in the temperature from New Delhi. So we have with us today, uh, Mr. Ratan Srivastava, uh, who is the managing director of Bao Group Asia in India. Uh, Ratan is a senior executive and management consulting professional with a proven track record in government consulting and industries across India and Southeast Asia with a wide network across stakeholders. Uh, Ratan has been instrumental in developing and implementing growth strategies for both the public and private sector and has led diverse teams to secure new market opportunities. And prior to BGA, Ratan was the former practice director at Frost & Sullivan as well as a former advisor to the Federation of the Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you so much, Ratan. Thank you, Tiffany. And I thank uh, ADR and Dindo to invite me to speak at this very prestigious forum. I have been preceded by my colleagues uh, who have added value to the discussion and Ernie set the tone for the discussion today. I am proud to just build on what they have said. Uh, the very term Indo-Pacific actually shows us the salience of India in the new emerging order in the region. When I say the new emerging order in the region, it is in view of what has been happening in the region in the past few years and these few years have been marked by the rise of China and the interference of China in South China Sea and the Indo-Pacific region. India had a sort of a hands-off policy before 1990 in Southeast Asia and ASEAN. In 1991, India embarked on a look east policy the Look East policy was started by Prime Minister Narasimha Rao at that point of time, which gave a strategic push to Indian engagement in the region. The present Act East policy is a continuation of the Look East policy started almost three decades back by Prime Minister Narasimha Rao. Now the Look East policy has been the precedence, but the Act East policy is more based on building the economic, strategic, military, and cultural relations with Southeast Asia. And in this region, ASEAN, of course, as a block of countries plays a very, very important role. Uh, the, the challenges that we face in the region could be economic, security, and defense cooperation. Uh, what I would say here is this, that the Indian strategy has been based more on working on a bilateral network than on uh, blockways, like uh, my colleague Kyo just said, why we, India did not sign the RCEP. Uh, there are reasons for it, of course, but India has been building bilateral relations with almost every country in the region, whether it is Vietnam, it is Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Australia, Japan, Korea. Uh, India has traditionally enjoyed very good relations with Japan, as Kyo would know. And India, Japan have been working together in East Asia to help countries in, in terms of economic and military cooperation. 
as well as now it's working on an informal system with United States, Australia, Japan. In Quad, what Jim referred about the Quad. The Quad is actually just an informal cooperation of these powers, which are democratic nations in ensuring a rules-based maritime order in the region. It is not to uh, it is not to prove militarily any points, but to ensure that this region follows a rules-based order of maritime independence. Uh, in this context, I would also like to talk about the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI, which again uh, re reaffirms what has been said earlier in terms of maritime domain independence. Uh, India, has, uh, India has followed a strategy with Philippines, which is based upon mutual cooperation and supporting Philippines in the region. There was a point of time uh, between 2016 and 2019 when the relationship was, uh, was not at the even level as the same it was before 2016. Uh, today we see that the relationship between India and Philippines is going back to pre-2016 levels. There is a large, uh, large, large, I would say, trade and economic interest between India and Philippines. Uh, India imports a lot of automotive and related components from Philippines and exports a lot of components as well. Uh, the India-Philippines trade obviously can do more. We are doing just about, at this point of time, $3 billion. To set the context, the Indo-ASEAN trade is at about $80 billion whereas Indo-Philippines trade is just about $3 billion. So this is something that we need to build on. Uh, the other issue here is this, that uh, India and Philippines both believe that no country should be able uh, to force uh, any kind of, uh, to use force to settle any disputes in the region. Uh, this has been reinforced in the fourth joint level, uh, jo joint commission for uh, Indo-Pacific cooperation, which met as early as November this, this month, on the 6th of November. India has also trying to, uh, is, is, also, is also giving maritime do domain awareness uh, systems to Philippines. India is now all set to, in, in, in all possibility, uh, provide Philippines with its most potent missile systems, which is called BrahMos. Uh, there is there is talk going on about the sale of this platform to Philippines, which is which is really a huge indicator of where Philippines stays in the Indian scheme of things. Uh, the, the 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 alignment of Philippines, uh, sort of non-alignment of Philippines rather with any major power like China or U.S. actually opens gates for middle powers to play a more important role in the region and in the Philippines scheme of things, I would say. Uh, I, uh, the, 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 the another point that one would like to make here is this, India, Japan, and US, all three major democratic nations are working together to ensure that there is safety, security, peace, and trade in the region, which is followed by international norms. And this is something which is an interest of Philippines. Uh, we at BGA, of course, are tracking very closely the interests of Philippines between India and Philippines, as well as between Philippines and the ASEAN regions. I would like to close this by saying that we definitely have challenges between uh, in the region, but at the same time, we also have huge lot of opportunities in ASEAN, ASEAN Plus, and Southeast Asia. And India is working very closely with all major democratic powers to ensure that there is safety and security in the region, as well as we promote trade, economy, and cultural cooperation in the region. Uh, Tiffany, I've been told to finish, so I think I'll have to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ratan, and I really appreciate you highlighting the ways that India is 
deepen its political, economic, and military engagement with other countries in the region. So we are now turning over to Q and A. Uh, so until 9:35 a.m. So please an enter your question in the dialogue box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, so far, I see that there's interest in the United States. So I want to take the moderator's prerogative to look ahead a bit and sort of unpack a little bit more of, on what US-Asia ties might look like after January 20th when the Biden administration takes office. So for my colleagues in the region, um, I would appreciate your thoughts on what your country would expect uh, from the Biden administration. As alluded to in the panel, we aren't going to automatically return to positions prior to the Trump administrations, and some challenges will stay such as trade being politically challenged, as Ernie mentioned, and also the sort of bipartisan hardening of views on China within Washington. So given that, um, how would the countries within the region aim to engage the Biden administration? And in particular, how is that approach gonna be different from engagement with the Trump administration, which was much more transactional in its calculus? Uh, for Ernie, um, the Trump's, there's a question from the audience. Uh, Trump's four years has changed the landscape in ASEAN um, about confidence um, in American diplomatic quality um, as well as credibility. So how do you think the Biden administration plans to restore this and what policies will be adopted to ensure that Southeast Asia states, um, their agency remains intact during this process? And I welcome thoughts from the panel. I think you uh, you probably ought to pick on some people, Tiffany, because uh, if you if you want the response from the region, <laughs> you, you're going to have to ask somebody first, and then I'll I'll be happy to address the other question. Great, thank you. Well, how about we go in the order of speakers? Um, I don't know whether Fergus or Jim want to kick us off. Sure, Tiffany, I'm happy to take a crack to begin. Um, so I think, you know, throughout the Trump administration and, and beyond the Trump administration, Australia's key security part, you know, ally is recognized on both sides of politics as the United States. And that's going to be an enduring phenomenon, regardless of uh, which administration it is. Um, I think out of all the um, you know, countries in the region, um, Australia has has probably managed with, uh, I think Japan's also done a, you know, a, a, had a remarkably close uh, working relationship with the United States as well throughout this administration. And while it's been definitely bumpy uh, through the, the Trump period, um, I think there's going to be an enduring engagement and then that's sort of been there through Trump and I think it will continue. What I would expect to be a little bit different under Biden would be, um, I think it's going to, we're going to revert back to a, a great level of consultation and more um, certainty around direction. So we had, you know, occasionally some of the Australian products would come up for a tariff, um, tariff hikes in the United States, and there'd be sort of a, a rush of diplomatic activity to prevent that from kicking into place. I think we won't see that type of, um, you know, chop, chopping at the, the knees of the alliance um, that we saw during this administration. I think we'll see uh, so much more predictability. Um, much more engagement in the region that I think will be really positive in terms of gluing up those alliances. On China, I think that the China policy is, is broadly going, like only said, I, I'd anticipate that would, um, lots of that will stay in place. Um, it'd probably be less, um, it, it'll be more predictable and, and less sort of barbed, but I think it'll, it'll continue and we'll start to see, you know, the joining up of alliances to push back against some of the more assertive behavior that we're seeing from the CCP. Um, so I would, I would see deepening engagement, uh, more use of alliances, joining up of activities to push back um, and a, you know, broad continuation of you know, pursuing things like human rights abuses and issues in Xinjiang and uh, encroachments into other territorial disputes in, in, in the region. So I'd, I'd see that as a bit of a continuation, but with a uh, more, in, um, more collegiate engagement with um, partners in the region. Just to add on to that, I think you're already seeing France taking a more active role in the Pacific um, in coordination with Australia and, and the United States. Uh, 
the Brits are sending more of their fleet over here every so often. Uh, again, as a sign that they have interests in the region and, and take them seriously. And I'd also think uh, we'll see NATO uh, trying to think how it can play a more active role uh, in the region. Uh, so I think the, the pivot of, of history and, and focus, as we've been saying all along, is shifting from Europe to Asia. And I think this is another example of all, all the middle and, and large powers in the world looking at this area. Thank you. Um, welcome thoughts from Kyo and Ratan on what Japan and India expects from the new Biden administration. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany. I think a keyword should be technology. You know, last four years, especially, you know, the last two years, we learned that, uh, you know, US Titan technology export to China. And uh, this is the code, you know, actually, the source, you know, cause of decoupling of supply chain. And in any case, you know, the Japanese companies and many multinational comp global companies should you know, think about, you know, diversification of supply chain from China to, or to, or to Southeast Asia mainly. But I think, that, you know, the technology is key. What kind of technology could be shared? As I said in my presentation, you know, we are now in a data-driven society and uh, what kind of technology could be shared and what kind of data obtained in one market and we should use other, can we use the outside the market? I think we should do that. And what kind of a norm is that uh, we should discuss many agenda we should discuss. I think, uh, you know, I welcome the Biden administration, you know, you know, close coordination with the allies or diplomatic back. I think this is a good thing. And the alliance cooperation to back this is a good thing. But I think a technology, you know, how we share that, how we compete, you know, with, you know, among Asia Indo-Pacific nations. I think we should, I really, I really, you know, like ask to President Director Biden to lead this kind of debate. Because about this is hugely, you know, every country in Southeast Asia, Japan and the United States, we have a huge stakes actually today, even today. Thank you. To build on, build on where uh, Kyo left, to build on where Kyo left, I would say, uh, there, uh, we don't see in India a huge shift in the policy uh, which is being followed at the Capitol Hill and New Delhi. Because India's ski, India's India's geographical location and the key uh, scheme of things is going to dictate the way the relationship has been going on. But definitely, as uh, Ernie said in the beginning, it's move is going to move out from more transactional deal making kind of a relationship uh, to a more wide ranging, open and uh, uh, more, I would say. Inclu inclusive kind of a relationship in which uh, all aspects of the of, of trade, defense and security, cultural exchanges, diversity would be key in this as we move forward between uh, the democratic administration which is coming and we've had, uh, India has had experience of working with President-elect Biden earlier when he was vice president with the Obama administration. And President Obama, uh, has visited India in both his terms. So that is that is where you know we see the continuance of the policies uh, between uh, the past administration and the Obama administration and the administration to come. Uh, we definitely expect more of defense and security cooperation between India and uh, US and that would affect the entire policy of these countries in the region more inclusive trade than we have right now based upon balance of trade, including moving into places where which are which are more, more helpful to both the countries. We also see diversity coming up as a part of the relationship, which will definitely have an impact on how things shape up in the Indo-Pacific. Go ahead, Ernie. 
So Tiffany, I think, um, uh, you know, how will the Biden administration win confidence back in Southeast Asia? Uh, generally was the question, I think. Um, I think that, um, you know, just, just to give a couple of concrete answers, uh, and, I, and I was basically making the argument, I think, during my, my talking points uh, earlier, but um, I, I think you'll see uh, a strong set of ambassadors. You'll see uh, uh, U.S. ambassadors in ASEAN countries. I think you'll see a strong U.S. ambassador to uh, ASEAN. Um, I think you'll see uh, more regu a regular, more regular policy process uh, for what I call middle management. But what I mean are, are assistant secretaries uh, who will engage the region uh, at defense and state in particular, uh, as well as USTR and commerce. Um, and I think if you look at the Biden team, there's a lot of um, continuity there and cohesiveness. Blinken and Sullivan at State and NSC know each other. They've worked with each other before. Um, you're not going to have uh, uh, silos, uh, so you'll have uh, you'll have. I think I think they'll probably be good a good choice at defense as well. And Michelle would be terrific, and, and she knows these guys well. Um, so you'd have uh, a lot of continuity, and um, I think um, ASEAN would be much reassured. Uh, if, if the American approach was, was again, was less transactional and more uh, process oriented, ASEAN is good at process, sometimes not good at uh, consensus, but ASEAN itself is working on um, a way to move forward, even if it doesn't have full consensus. So uh, in the economic sphere, when the ASEAN had to move forward on economics, because it's either move forward or die, um, you know, when you have such trade dependent economies, you can't sit around and twiddle your thumbs for the lowest common denominator. Um, they, they came up with the 10 minus X formula and that formula can be used uh, if the ASEAN leaders decide to, to use it um, so that ASEAN can move forward if, if um, countries, uh, and let's just go ahead and say it, like Cambodia or Laos are being pressured, you know, very heavily by the Chinese to to take a different view or stand on the side. And, and so I think um, uh, that is gonna be necessary, some reform in that ASEAN process to give the, the, um, the organization a bit more credibility and, and, and a practical ability to move forward with the, with the Biden administration and the Americans and, and other partners, the Japanese, the Australians, the Indians and others, uh, Europe on key issues and build resilience into the, the approach so that uh, working together, we can convince China that what's in their interest is to play by the rules of the game that everyone else is playing by. And, and China, will, I think we all want China to be a, a large and prosperous economy. We just don't want China. No one wants China to dictate uh, the rules of the road or impinge uh, its um, its, its sovereign uh, territorial views or, or other sovereign interests uh, on smaller countries in the neighborhood. Thank you, Ernie. Um, so another topic that's gotten a lot of questions is the South China Sea, um, specifically uh, with what's gonna be needed to maintain the balance of power in the South China Sea. So I'm gonna cluster together a few questions uh, for probably Ernie, Jim, Keo, and Liz. Uh, the first question is, what would be the Biden administration's strategic policy goals uh, with respect to addressing China's gray zone challenges um, in the, in, to mitigate and return the state of regional maritime security and stability, so applying to the South China Sea and also to the East China Sea? And for Liz, um, what ought to be the priority um, in the South China Sea, given what we've seen in terms of the rapid building and reinforcement of infrastructure? Um, as we've seen, uh, AI and satellite technology is incredibly important in the 21st century. So how can data such as yours um, contribute to formulating effective policies? Um, and then maybe a final take on the South China Sea is, can, can we talk more about any initiatives to facilitate a safe and secure uh, mar maritime cooperation? 
um, focusing on in terms of architecture, what do we have in terms of platforms that can help minimize the growing tensions in the South China Sea from a military standpoint. So a few different angles there and welcome thoughts from um, Liz, Keo, uh, Jim or Ernie. I'm happy to start. I think that part of our goal is to illuminate what's going on. I think that when everybody has the same data and everybody can see what's happening, there's a lot more to talk about and you can't kind of bury things under the rug and pretend they're not happening. And I think without the visibility that people um, have had, you can't really understand what's actually happening and you can't get it with timely timeliness. And so with AI, with our software, we can make everyone aware of what's happening as it's happening so that nobody can hide. Yeah, I, I just wanna say thank you to Liz uh, for her work in that area. I, I was, when I built, was building the CSIS uh, Southeast Asia chair. We, we created something called the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative or AMTI. And I'm sure Liz has contributed, uh, her company's contributed a lot of uh, uh, data and, and images um, to that, or, or, or if she hasn't, I, I hope she will. Um, but I completely agree. Um, and the whole, the whole trick there was that, um, you know, satellite companies and, and intelligence agencies knew a lot about what was happening, but it was all stuck in classified silos. And there had to be some way to declassify some of this information and, and, and have the truth. So that's a big part of the answer to the question about how to address the gray zone activities uh, in the South China Sea is uncover the truth about what, you know, what's going on, who's moving where, who's building what, um, that's critical. The other thing is building resilience and cooperation, better communications within militaries, and probably Jim can speak to this much better than I can, but um, the fact that the ASEAN defense ministers uh, started uh, about 15 years ago now meeting together, it used to be only their chiefs of staff that could meet because it was sensitive for ASEAN defense ministers to meet because of the history, the post-colonial um, or new independence history of, of the region. They now have a regular um, uh, uh, meeting, at not only that, but there's uh, the ASEAN plus six uh, uh, format for the, um, for the ministers within the East Asia Summit. Um, and there's an ASEAN plus three for the East Asia uh, and Southeast Asia cooperation. And this stuff, this increasing cooperation, uh, multilateral and minilateral um, cooperation and exercises uh, really help to reduce uh, or build trust, uh, increase transparency and, and communication and go a long way to reducing the, the um, really pernicious impact of, of this, these gray zone sort of operations by, um, you know, a quasi commercial <laughs> fleet that's actually uh, an expanded Chinese um, uh, maritime fleet or, or Coast Guard. Just to just add on to what Ernie said, uh, a big problem over the years was actual uh, disputes between ASEAN nations about their maritime boundaries. And uh, as those have slowly been resolved, it makes it easier for uh, ASEAN countries, militaries to cooperate together. And we've seen that uh, in the Sulu Sea actually between Malaysia and the Philippines directed against uh, terrorists and pirates. Uh, so hopefully that will continue. Uh, hopefully more intelligence sharing will continue. That's also been another siloed problem. Uh, but I know the United States and a lot of the ASEANs are working on that. Uh, the gray zone question is a really good one, but the thing to remember about gray zone is it goes both ways. So while uh, China may use its fishermen and arm to the teeth Coast Guard cutters to try and influence activity in uh, EEZs of other countries, similarly, uh, they are very reluctant to take really violent action against, say, Philippine fishing boats 
because of the negative publicity it's getting uh, when they do that. So it, it does cut both ways. And I think we're seeing, other than the increased militarization and buildup of these features in the South China Sea, there's not a lot new going on. And I don't know if that's because they're on a pause to try and uh, let tensions simmer down or uh, they're playing a long game and waiting for attention to go elsewhere, whatever it is. Um, I, I guess my, my bottom line is this is gonna be a long, long, long effort. And uh, the more ASEAN comes together to find ways to push back in the United Way, the more effective it's gonna be. Thanks, Jim. The, uh, from Japan perspective, I think uh, we are now, Japan is not now, now more proactive in terms of a defense armament cooperation with South Asian countries. Like uh, Philippines, we have uh, some uh, very successful project about the letter. And uh, recently that uh, the media reported that, that Japan is now planning to talking to Indonesia about the uh, uh, submarine type of cooperation. I think, uh, you know, this is, I think we have a lot of opportunity because of, uh, you know, some uh, very complementary relations in terms of the defense armament cooperation between Japan and the Southeast Asian, you know, friends. And they also, the we share the, the uh, kind of interest of apparently. So I think uh, we should, Japan and the you know, Southeast Asian countries and in cooperation with the, the United States. I think we should, our coordinated efforts should be very important. Thank you. Thank you, Kyo. And staying on the topic of China, there's been several questions. Um, I want to ask the panel, uh, there's a question from the audience of, in your view, what are the top three red lines uh, for China, whether in the trade or military perspective? And you know, how would China respond if those red lines were uh, moving closer or potentially uh, crossed. So maybe we'll start with Fergus because I think you've covered China fairly extensively in your presentation, but would also welcome thoughts from Ratan Okio in light of uh, Japan and India facing off with China in their various border disputes as well. Um, thanks, Tiffany. Uh, look, I think there's, you know, the, one of the biggest red line issues that's coming up right now is um, Taiwan um, and recognition of Taiwan. There's during the transition period, you know, there's a lot of discussion here about whether that, that opens up an opportunity to do something um, more assertive there for the, the CCP. So I think that's that's got to be number one on everyone's list and, um, you know, of high level of concern, I think, for, for regional stability. Um, the South China Sea, I think, as well is a um, you know there's there's lots of red lines in lots of different places there for um, everyone to, to to get around. Um, I think one of the interesting proposals that was put forward this week on the on the trade front was around um, like-minded states banding together to push back against coercive economic measures. Um, so there was a, a proposal mooted to, um, you know, for, for states that are facing coercive economic diplomacy to, to get together and impose sanctions in retaliation against that. Uh, I think that would be very frustrating for the CCP because it would stymie that that approach, but it's, um, I don't know if it would be quite called a red line, but I think it would definitely be uh, a deep frustration for them. Ratan or Kio, any thoughts from your respective perspectives? I think uh, I would agree with uh, Fergus as far as South China Sea is concerned. And uh, that's one red line that could be of a lot of importance to India. But the most important aspect that uh, would come into India and China is the border tension. Uh, India and China's red line that has to be crossed or sort of been crossed as well at some point of time is the border tension between India and China in the northern region, in the northeastern region. Uh, that's something uh, which we need to very closely look and monitor. The other red line is 
the encircling of uh, Indian Ocean by China, by a string of pearls, whether it is starting from Thailand to Myanmar, to Sri Lanka, to Pakistan, and going on to Nepal and Bangladesh. Uh, some of these nations are highly indebted to the soft loans given by China. And now they are realizing, especially like Sri Lanka has just realized that they had to behold one of their ports, which was built with Sri Lankan, with Chinese assistance. Uh, similar is the case in the airport that China had helped Sri Lanka build. So that's again, a red line, which, uh, which, is, which, which could have potential implications if crossed more. The third and final, of course, is uh, the growing importance of the association of democratic nations in the region, uh, led by India, Ch India, United States, Australia, and Japan. Uh, that if, if China feels it could be a threat militarily to them, uh, in view of the Malabar ex exercises, which have just happened in the Indian Ocean, uh, recently concluded Malabar exercises with all the four countries, if it but if it views it as a security threat to China, maybe that could be one of the reasons that uh, we could have a potential problem. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think uh, everybody here needs peaceful, prosperous in the Pacific or Asia. And uh, to achieve this goal, I think. Uh, from Japan perspective, I think we should have very peaceful and successful management. Our, you know, island territorial dispute with China, Senkaku. And also, you know, Taiwan is very close to us. And he which has a very, you know, huge international politics issue for everybody. So what I hope is that, uh, you know, both sides, everybody, should have a very successful, peaceful management of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. So turning now to US-Philippine relations and perhaps these are questions for Jim and Ernie because you covered this pretty extensively uh, during your presentations. Um, there's a few questions about where US-Philippine alliance will go under the Biden administration. So the first question is, in the matter of regional health security, Ernie, as you mentioned, what are some areas of potential cooperation? Um, second, uh, how will the US sort of walk the tightrope of negotiating future status of the visiting forces agreement with the Philippines while raising human rights concerns. How do you think this dilemma should and would be dealt with by the Biden presidency? Um, and last point, uh, will the Biden administration be truly committed to support the Philippines against the growing threat of China? Uh, well, Jim, I'll start if, if you're comfortable and, and please jump in. I, I, so three areas, I think uh, it's health, uh, VFA and, and, and treaty commitment. Um, really good questions. Um, I think on, on healthcare, uh, the Biden team has already indicated that they're going to shift the American position from um, uh, sort of America first or America only uh, sort of view on um, uh, vaccines and the pandemic. And, and I think they will be much more keenly aware of um, uh, multinational or uh, uh, engagement and cooperation in, in ensuring that countries um, have access to the vaccines and and they will I think more liberally use aid money and support as part of their diplomacy uh, these guys believe in this kind of stuff uh, and they know that um, if you if you aren't there to support allies uh, when the chips are down, uh, and, and they're down in, in, uh, in a case like uh, COVID-19 um, and they've been down before in typhoons when, when we've really uh, come and to the Philippines aid and, and worked closely with the Philippine Armed Forces to, to help uh, people in the country. I, I think you're gonna see a, a much stronger response there, both bilaterally because the Philippines is an ally and uh, within the ASEAN context and, and quite possibly 
uh, some concentric layers of support. I, I'm not sure about whether the Americans will rejoin or, or join, not rejoin, COVAX, uh, which is the international um, uh, coalition for, for COVID vaccines. Um, I, I don't know the policies and ins and outs and how the Biden team think will think about that. On, on the VFA, um, I think it was a great and strategic move by Secretary Lorenzana and the Philippine government to extend the VFA uh, like they did. I, I think this was just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that gives everybody some room to operate. Uh, I think the Americans, Biden will be well aware of Philippine elections coming up in 2022. It's no secret that President Duterte just doesn't trust uh, the Americans, I think, in his gut. Um, he, he has issues with uh, with with the Americans, and um, you know, even uh, you know when when I think the the U.S. was trying to lean as forward as it could, uh, he was he didn't want to take that hand uh, at least fully. And so, I, I think the Americans will be watching carefully and um, trying to to think about how they can read the tea leaves in Manila so that they can support appropriately based on what Filipinos want and need um, the, the support uh, through the visiting forces agreement. And, and we have, uh, as you know, uh, a, a very extensive mutual plan to build up uh, Philippine defense capabilities around the country that I think will, will and can be renewed um, if, if Philippine leadership uh, wants to do that. And finally, um, on the treaty commitment, uh, I think, I, I know, from, <laughs> talked with a lot of the, the guys that we've just mentioned who will be on Biden's team. Um, they understand that, that the alliance, um, the alliances uh, in Asia are very important, that the alliance with the Philippines is core. It would be uh, influenced by who's president, as we've seen under Trump and, and Duterte. Um, but I think they will uh, continue to build on uh, what I think has been a, a sort of very con, um, continuous and clear chain of uh, American support for the Treaty Alliance. I think the Americans have been, um, you know, they've always been interested in sort of strategic ambiguity, so you don't create a fight by being too clear um, or create confidences that, you know, give people the wrong messages. But I, I think lately, even under the Trump administration, um, uh, the Americans have been more and more clear. And I think the Biden team will continue with that level of clarity. I, I can tell you, having been in, had my nose in the, in the game on this for decades now, that um, I think if, if the Philippines was attacked, uh, in the South China Sea or in their waters uh, under certain con um, conditions or attacked by a foreign power in their, in their waters and their people were directly attacked. I think it's, it's pretty clear the Americans would be at the Filipino side. Just to add on to the last point by Ernie, uh, Secretary Pompeo made that very clear uh, fairly recently. I also say, you know, the question arises because during the Obama administration, the administration negotiated mutual pullback from Scarborough Shoal. Uh, the Chinese went back in, the Americans didn't push back. Uh, when the Arbitral, Arbitral Tribunal found for the Philippines, uh, the administration applauded it, but it was very quiet trying to give China a way to save face and meet the findings of the tribunal. When China didn't do that, there was no robust response. So I think the People coming into this administration uh, feel quite strongly that their previous approach with China didn't work and they actually embarrassed them. So they want to they want to show to the Philippines and other allies and partners in the region they've learned their lesson. Thank you very much, uh, Jim and Ernie. And with that, we are at time. Um, I wanna thank the panel for this rich discussion of the challenges that Asia's middle powers face as they navigate the changing economic and political currents of the region. Uh, while we see that countries are hedging between US-China competition, they are also seeking to drive agendas and exerting 
influence well beyond their borders. So now that we've discussed the current challenges, I believe the next session will turn to how countries are developing capabilities to against emerging security challenges. And I am very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, Rupert Hammond Chambers, as the moderator of the next session. Rupert is an expert on Taiwanese politics and economic issues, and additionally brings a special focus on defense and security to Bao Group Asia. Rupert is also currently uh, leading the US Taiwan Business Council, where he was he elected vice president in 1998 and president in 2000. And prior to the US Taiwan Business Council, uh, he was at the Center for Security Policy, uh, Defense and Foreign Policy think tank here in Washington. So with that, please join me in thanking the speakers of this panel and welcoming the next panel. Over to you, Rupert. <clears throat> Hi, it's actually, um, we would have been very happy to have Rupert moderate, but I think we have Richard <laughs> moderating this panel. My apologies, wow. Um, no, it's, it's I right. am very sorry. Um, <laughs> Richard, I am very sorry for the mix up in the initials of the mod next moderator. And <laughs> I will not take up any more time of your panel. So I will turn it right over to you. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Tiffany, for that. No problem. I thought I'm the only RJH uh, in the town. I hope you can hear me. Um, I think folks may be used to my more uh, high octane way of uh, moderating or presenting things. Unfortunately, I've been stuck in a 20 hour transit. So you're going to see a lower octane version of me. Uh, we had a fantastic discussion a while ago on the, what different countries in the Indo-Pacific are doing uh, to deal with the challenges of our time and the evolution of the Indo-Pacific strategy under, uh, well, Trump administration, but how we're going to move uh, towards the Biden administration. I think it's quite interesting to see that uh, in one of his latest statement, President Biden used the term secure and prosperous in the Pacific. So perhaps we won't be using FOIP, free and open in the Pacific as much. And my hunch is that secure and prosperous is a kind of a code term for alliances and free trade elements that to a certain degree were de-emphasized under the Trump administration. So thank you very much for those discussion. Now we're gonna go to a set of speakers who will give us some ideas uh, within the limited time on what are the emerging challenges in the Indo-Pacific and how specifically we're gonna deal with them. Uh, the program originally put actually uh, Dr. Rene de Castro as the first speaker here, but uh, there is a request. Uh, I hope that that's okay with uh, Dr. de Castro if Dr. Cavaliero Anthony uh, could go ahead. Uh, Dr. Uh, Caballero, uh, Meli Cavaliero Anthony is actually professor and head of the Center for Non-Traditional Security at Roger Nam School of International Studies. Uh, she's always one of the leading sources uh, for assessing what are the threats we're facing and how we're coping with them. So uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Meli, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Richard. And um, let me first thank the um, ADR for the kind invitation to join this very interesting uh, conference and also to thank uh, the organizers for, um, uh, you know, for having a, a session on what we call, um, I won't call them emerging because these challenges have actually emerged. <laughs> so I I'm going to uh, show my slides. Um, uh, just so because uh, the, the number of points, and I think it's better if I, I just have um, this slide on. Okay. Um, right, so can you see that, uh, Richard? Is that okay? Right, so it, it is important, I guess, to know that um, the kind of conflicts that we now see um, across the world and also in the Asia Pacific, it's not just really driven by, you know, great power competition and um, a, a competition over resources. Uh, we have in fact seen in the last, especially in the last two decades, a growing list of security challenges that affect not just states, but affect the very survival and well-being of, of societies. And what's interesting with the contemporary security challenges is the fact that they are transnational in scope, 
right? Uh, I will turn to, of course, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which I think is the best example of the transnationality of these issues. But also to, to bear in mind that there are several drivers of insecurity. And, and there's, there's two that we could really think about. One is the rapid, rapid advances of technology. And that has raised, of course, a lot of benefits, but a lot of unease. And I think we have a session, uh, I would imagine, on cybersecurity. And that really affects not just the security of the state, the sovereignty of the state, but even the security of individuals. And the second is really the changing global climate. And you would then understand why the incoming US administration, uh, uh, President-elect Biden, is really putting climate change as one of the core pillars of its foreign policy. So with all of these rapid changes brought on by technology and by the changing climate, we are really seeing a growing salience of non-traditional security challenges. So you ask yourself, what's so non-traditional about these threats anyway? Well, I talked about transnational in nature, especially in its origin and its effect, right? You could have forest fires in, in, in our Kalimantan region, and that affects the whole, you know, environment, uh, the air quality of its neighboring countries and affecting businesses and the health of its people. But the threats are not just only man-made by triggered really by, as I said earlier on, global climate change. And I think what's important to note, um, especially in our part of the world, that the impact of this is very difficult to reverse or to repair. Imagine, for example, the, you know, the drying up of rivers which is the fountain of life for many communities. The melting of the, of the Alps uh, or, or in the Himalayas, which is causing extreme weather events. And this impacts severe um, and, and large communities. So, you know, in, in real politic, when you, when you want to differentiate what is high politics in terms of, you know, major power competition, arms race, a nuclear proliferation, it's sometimes not very hard to differentiate <laughs> between what's high and low, depending really on the context where you, where, you, where you find yourselves in. And since this is a conference in, you know, held in online, of course, in the Philippines and many developing parts of the region, you really have to question a race concern about the capacity of the government to deal with these transnational threats. So I thought I, I really like this screen because you know when you look at global risk uh, as prepared by the World Economic Forum for 2020, you know we've talked so much about high probability, low impact, or low probability, high impact. But if you look at this global listing, you will see that you know on the far right. You have extreme weather events and climate change, which is both high impact and high probability. But you talk about weapons of mass destruction is actually here. Likelihood is low, of course, high impact. And there's here infectious diseases. Maybe this was done before 20, before the end of 20, uh, 2019, but you would then bring it here, really. So what it tells you is that, you know, our, our um, analysis of what uh, is important in terms of security challenges would therefore have to be really tested based on the priorities of states, its impact on its people, and really on capacities, right? So we talk so much about climate change, and I'm starting with this because I think many of the we so-called 21st century challenges really stems from what we take for granted as the climate, the, 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 the global climate. And in 2018, when the UNFCCC talked about, you know, keeping it the global temperature to 1.5 degree temperature and ensuring that we reduce our global greenhouse emissions, there's been no consensus since then, right? And as you know, the Trump administration really reneged on its commitment to the Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement that threw many people off. Because if, if us, as I will raise later on, very important in the strategy and in the attempts to address these transnational challenges is really global leadership, right? So this is where, you know, when you talk about why is it so important that Trump has left and why it is important or heartening to know that, that Biden administration is going to come back to cl climate change agreement because 
really of its impact and the kind of resources and decisions that it tries to bring uh, countries together. And let me run through very quickly the impact of climate change. Now, I always tell my students, when you talk about climate change, you think about existing conflicts being aggravated. That's one big, quite difficult sometimes to capture. But when you talk about peace and security, right? Climate change and its impact, whether on water, on food, on energy, on, on many other things, on health, it is a risk multiplier and intensifies cu current conflicts, right? And its impact, frequent and more intense weather events. I I'm talking to a Filipino crowd uh, mostly, and of course, and you would, of course, it, no need to say more about this with, you know, I always say Indonesia and the Philippines, you know, are the top supermarkets of extreme weather events in, in the world, right? You name it, we have it, whether it is cyclones, you know, typhoons, whatever, earthquakes. And it's impact really on basic things like production of, of food, for example, competition on water. Um, and it reverses, once this is not addressed and not handled properly, it reverses economic gains that have been achieved over the years. And when there is economic conflict, it undermines cohesion, right? And it destabilizes fragile regions. Think, for example, of what it does, all these extreme weather events to regions in the Philippines, Southern Philippines that are already in conflict and that will have to bear the brunt of um, climate change. So it increases demands on states capacity and puts pressure on, on governance. So <clears throat> I will, so when you talk about too much water, it's not just Southeast Asia, really. We're talking about, when you talk about state security, when your territory is under threat because of changing climate, right? You, we, we know about the Maldives having uh, uh, expressed concern that they might not have a territory right, come 2050, for example, or our neighbors in the Pacific, right? And um, the rising sea levels really have affects what we call mega cities in Southeast Asia, whether you call Jakarta or Bangkok or Thailand. And it's, if you talk about displacement of people, right, uh, we worry so much about migrants, you know, as of migration, but displacement as a result of, of natural disasters in 2019 alone, you know, just natural disasters is almost 25 million people displaced around the world. Um, but if you don't have enough water as a result of dry rivers, now when you talk about its impact on major power competition, now Northern China and parts of Mongolia and, and South Asia are water stress. And um, a, a famous Indian scholar, uh, uh, Brahma Chilani, has always talked about wars not being fought based on uh, you know, nuclear capabilities, but because as a result of water conflicts between countries that are also nuclear weapon states. You talk about water stress India, water stress Pakistan, right? And water stress parts of China. So you have that too much water, not enough water, and its impact of not enough water on food right, whether it's impact on crops, on livelihoods, on, on, on fisheries, for example, or on forest, the FAO has talked about that in its report year after year after year. And I think, you know, if you want to translate that, uh, if there's impact on, you know, food production, for example, you're talking about, you know, people that will be undernourished, right, more hungry people, 840 million by 2030, not very far from there. And especially in urban areas where, and in, in the region where the population is going to increase mostly in Asia and where Asia is also most affected. And there will be some who, thought, who think that if you don't handle food security issues, it's going to spark that kind of conflict within states. And um, I, I like the, 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 the reference to the, what happened in the Middle East about the Arab Spring, which, which was triggered by so much human misery over lack of food, the one person decided to, you know, torture himself, and that basically triggered what we call the Arab Springs. And the other, I think, other than climate change, is really pandemics. And you know, I, I thought we should just deal with this a bit because, you know, Southeast Asia is not a stranger to to pandemics. We had SARS in two thousand and three, right? We had <clears throat> bird flu or COVID. 
sorry, H1, uh, H5N1 in 2009 and H1N1 in 2009. But if you look at just in terms of its impact, I mean, the last count uh, that I, I saw uh, on the impact of just, you know, the spread of this pandemic, right, with, which originated in one state and just be, because of travel, right, it has spread. I don't think there's anyone in the world that's actually, any country in the world that's actually immune from this a crisis, a pandemic that's very extraordinary, uh, once in a century, as the WHO would say, for example, and that has caused such severe economic crisis likened to the worst uh, depression, economic depression in the 1930s. <clears throat> so you have cases 59.1 million uh, in, in cases around the world, death is 1.4 million, um, and uh, if you compare that with what we had in 2003, you know, you 8,000 against 59.1 million. So it's, it's really the gravity and the immensity of it. And we, we cannot no longer dismiss the need to be able to prepare for this kind of what we call black swans, for example. Uh, <clears throat> so these are just examples of emerging, uh, of emerged security challenges around the world. And you ask yourself, therefore, so what can we do? I mean, how do you shield yourself or prepare for these things, right? Um, <clears throat> well, first is I think accepting if you're a policymaker that you now have a proliferation of security challenges that have come up front, right? Competing with the priorities of defending your, uh, your territory against foreign incursions, for example, defending your territory against the threat of you know, other um, malign uh, intentions of other states, underscoring, secondly, the interconnectedness of these issues and challenges. If you talk about climate change, it doesn't mean anything if you don't talk about extreme weather events, its impact on food production, right? its impact on health, its impact on displacement of people. And because these are transnational challenges, it, there is a compelling, compelling case for, you know, not going it alone, but going multilateral in, in responses, in policies, and, um, and recognizing that states alone cannot handle this, that you really need the participation of other members of the community. Non-state actors, your NGOs in trying to help people understand that you need to have new habits in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19, right? Uh, international foundations that will help us in the production and the distribution first access and distribution of very important vaccines like the Gates Foundation, et cetera. And so it also has very severe implications or important implications on, on norms, practices, right? That it is not enough for you to be complacent, that there are certain norms that you follow, for example, uh, mandatory reporting of outbreaks of infectious diseases, uh, trying to reduce global greenhouse emissions, preparing to manage crises through uh, early warning systems, right? Or um, even down to having the ability to manage conflicts among states. We have an issue with that in our part of the world. And again, I said, it's no longer just a state. You know, when you ask the question, who provides for security in times of uncertainty? It's no longer just the state. It's just state plus other actors other actors like your local communities, your private sector, <coughs> regional organizations, national foundations. So I'll pause here and we can take this up maybe in a Q&A. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Melai, for uh, that uh, very important presentation and keeping it within the 10 minutes. I'm sure there's so much for you to talk about. I mean, uh, your presentation reminds me of Robert Kaplan's The Coming Anarchy and his argument back in the 1990s that the defining issue of the 21st century will actually be nature and natural disasters. And I actually love the fact that you also emphasize that the word emerging tends to be very overused, if not abused, when it comes to non-traditional security issues. It's kind of like emerging China. China's already emerged in the same way. A lot of these NTS issues that you have mentioned have already emerged. So it's just a question of the gravity and how much effectively we're dealing with them. Uh, and thanks for emphasizing also issues of capacity building and the need for climate adaptation. Perhaps later on we can discuss more about this because again everyone's talking about uh, President Biden 
coming back to the Paris Accord, the South Koreans, the Japanese and Europeans have already gone ahead giving their own 2050 and 2060 zero carbon emission commitments, including China. But I want to hear more from other countries, including India, for instance, which is among the biggest new contributors of uh, greenhouse gases or Australia, which is one of the highest per capita emissions of greenhouse houses. So I think there's a lot of talk about as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, and perhaps here in ASEAN, the Mekong River could be the defining non-traditional security issue that could turn into a much more traditional issue as water scarcity becomes a terrible issue. And for some reason, ASEAN talks a little bit about South China Sea, but not much collectively on the, um, the Mekong River issue. Now, let's go to the next speaker who was actually supposed to be the first one. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ren de Castro for um, allowing us to make certain adjustments uh, for Melai to go a little bit ahead. Uh, so Dr. De Castro actually just made a, a comprehensive special report uh, for ADR Institute on the emerging challenges in the 21st century and, the, and how the Indo-Pacific is coping with the US-China competition and the pandemic at the same time. Uh, so the floor is yours, uh, Dr. De Castro. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the organizer for giving me the opportunity to do a public presentation on my presentation regarding uh, this very important issue. Oops, let me fix first my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, maybe uh, la uh, last December, I cannot imagine myself conducting a presentation on this topic of non-traditional security issue. In fact, the last time I attended an activity that has something to do with a non-traditional security issue was in a conference when I attended a presentation of Melly in Singapore. This was in 2010 when she talked about epidemics. At that time, I find her presentation very insightful and very interesting, but I cannot simply imagine during that time that it will happen. You know, this uh, World War Z would happen, that we will be confronted with an invisible enemy pandemic. And sure enough, it has happened. So my presentation will focus on two aspects. Number one, of course, is the fact that pandemic, you have the biological element there, but at the same time, you have also the social political dynamics. You have, of course, states. So let me start first with a concept, you know, the concept of human security or specifically health security, which is an offshoot of the post Cold War concept of human security that we move away from simply securitizing the state to the fact that we have to securitize people and community. So a very, uh, you know, I use this definition. Uh, uh, health security in the context of the 21st century has to do with preventive measure to protect people from emerging in infection, the stress of insufficient healthcare, and of course, poor public health infrastructure. Of course, the goal of health security is pandemic preparedness. That is primarily true health surveillance. That is, we have to warn people that there is an incoming pandemic. This had moved away from, of course, the uh, paradigm way back in the 1960s that we need to cure or address. No, the purpose now is basically an early warning device that sooner or later, because of globalization, because of climate change, because of the fact that uh, human societies has been expanding, into the forest, rainforest, so forth and so on, you will have contacts with wild animals and you will have, of course, this transfer. Uh, first, uh, means a movement away from state-centric, as Melly mentioned, to something more of a multilateral and, of course, pandemic preparedness embodied preemptive approach to the regulation and control of emerging uh, diseases through, of course, generating responses for prediction that this might happen and we have to do something about it. If pandemics break out, they are immediately considered world, worldwide public health emergency because it's happening in the context of a global society. So what is basically the, uh, the bedrock when we talk about global public health security or the global public health system? We talk about the WHO. Let global public health system focuses on pandemic preparedness and, of course, securing the global community from the unexpected emergence of a pandemic. Uh, the WHO, of course, is the most uh, significant international actor organization when it comes to managing. That's the only one we get. Uh, public health system against, of course, and of course, this is the notion of the threat. 
not pandemic or diseases that are of course endemic, like for example, tuberculosis, polio, so forth and so on. Something that is of course uh, unexpected, the notion of emerging infectious disease or diseases. COVID-19 pandemic, of course, is the first major biological upheaval that has rocked the 21st century. The last major pandemic ever since we had the great influenza pandemic in 1918 and oh no, uh, immediately after the First World War. And of course, unfortunately, the WHO had failed to manage or contain the global spread of COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, this is where we talk about the political dimension. This is because a powerful, wealthy, emergent and an authoritarian member of the global society, China has undermined the WHO from fulfilling its essential role in mobilizing and warning the world about the coming pandemic and of course, mobilizing the global public health system against of course the spread of a new, an emerging infectious disease and that is of course COVID-19. I'll just breeze through the, uh, you know, what's basically the notion of the global public health system. And of course, in relation to, to that, the notion of, pub, of health security. So pandemic is defined, of course, an epidemic occurring worldwide, international, over a wide uh, area crossing, of course, international boundaries. Of course, we can look back into history when we can look at pandemics during the time of the uh, Peloponnesian War, during the time of Tosidides, then during the time of the Middle Ages, you talk about the Black Death. Uh, then, of course, the most recent one that happened almost 100 years ago, in the aftermath of the First World War, the great influenza pandemic that killed more than 50 million people. So of course, prior to the 19th century, addressing pandemics was limited to state-centric intervention. Uh, of course, there was an effort that began in the mid 19th century when you have international conferences. But of course, the big break happened in 1948 with the, of course, creation of the World Health Organization under the auspices of the United Nations. And the task of the WHO is, of course, directing and coordinating authority on global health security governance within the uh, United Nations system. Uh, the WHO has, of course, a specific task when it comes to uh, managing a uh, global pan uh, pandemic. Uh, this is, of course, again, the notion raised by Melly that it should be multilateral, it should be international, but nevertheless, the WHO is still very much dependent on territorial nation states in terms, of course, of surveillance. So the WHO global public health system introduced three innovations in the global society. Number one, extension of public health activities beyond the nation state, as mentioned by Melly. The shift, of course, from treating current or endemic diseases to surveillance at the level of individuals to the level of population. And of course, the expansion of surveillance to encompass communication and information and data about emerging pandemics. Yes, it usually happen in Africa and of course, in certain parts of Asia. Its purpose is to prevent against control and provide a public health response to international spread of emerging infections. In particular importance is the member states, of course, have undertaken to notify. So this is the task of nation states. If there's an ongoing epidemic in your country, you have to report to the WHO and be transparent about this pandemic. So the WHO could warn other member states about this pandemic. But of course, this requires states to develop minimum core capacities through national legislation, policy financing, and develop capabilities for surveillance response and so forth and so on. So although you have this global system, it's still very much dependent at the level of the nation state. Unfortunately, of course, in several instances, starting with the SARS pandemic in China, then of course the Ebola uh, pandemic in Africa, in several instances of pandemic outbreaks, however, Many states have intentionally refused to disclose information or failed to do so in a timely ma manner, resorting uh, to the public being misinformed or the international public being informed of false expectation regarding the pandemic. Uh, whether, of course, a member state will share to the WHO regarding a pandemic would depend on two factors. A country's self-interest, because if you warn other countries that there is a, a you know, it, it, uh, an epidemic in your country, you will see your borders being shut down, your citizens not being allowed to enter that country. Plus, of course, the WHO's ability to construct a framework for international cooperation 
on infectious diseases that may, of course, withstand expanding global threats. Again, the ability of the WHO to uh, conduct international surveillance and, of course, warn members of the international community about an emerging infectious disease. I'll just breeze through this. Of course, let's, let's look at, of course, the role of China. Uh, of course, everybody knows that it happened in China, but what could have the Chinese uh, government and the Chinese uh, Communist Party could have done to mitigate the impact of this pandemic? Of course, in the uh, last past uh, 10 years, there have been cases where you have tensions between states, especially in Africa during the e Ebola pandemic, swine flu, where uh, states would try to hide an uh, epidemic in their country. The WHO, of course, expecting cooperation, transparency, a form of transparency. But of course, states would have to in take into account what would be the economic, commercial, political, and diplomatic implication if they will warn other countries that there is an epidemic in their country. Uh, of course, in the case of China, the Chinese Communist Party has, of course, inadvertently facilitated the outbreak, the spread of the, uh, the uh, two emerging uh, infectious diseases. The one is SARS, uh, way back in 2003, 2004, and of course, the current COVID-19 pandemic. By taking steps to prevent the early detection and investigation of this emerging diseases, by, of course, concealing its outbreak. And this lack of transparency is a feature, it's systemic. It's not a uh, failure of the system because it's built in in the Chinese system of governance, control. You know, a uh, lack of transparency and of course the Communist Party being very protective of its power. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the virus caused COVID was of course first detected in Wuhan, uh, capital city of China. First human infection had been detected as late November, December. Uh, of course, I'll just breeze through this, important to examine. What transpired from late November 2019 when the first cases of COVID-19 uh, were detected and of course up to January 20, the first day when the Chinese National Health Authority finally admitted that COVID-19 has human to human transmission mechanism. I'll just breeze through this. Of course, you have cases that immediately the government started a crackdown, information blockade, hospitals, uh, strict government control over information about the emerging disease was seen as the main reason for the news blackout, which caused people to be unaware and unprepared for the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it was observed, of course, that local government officials underreported that there is an outbreak going on. Uh, local officials just breeze through this. As late as January 15, the Wuhan Municipal Commission claimed that they find no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission denying, despite the fact that Taiwan has already sent medical experts to Wuhan and they have already reported and informed the WHO as early as January 2020, uh, COVID-19 can be transferred from one human to another. Uh, Chinese National Center for Disease Control did not explicitly admit that COVID-19 can transmit from human to human. However, Chinese, and of course, as early as you know, uh, January, early January, two Chinese academics have already warned that uh, there are cases of human to human transfer as early as January 11, uh, 2020. Uh, w China was able to enlist the WHO in its cover up, early pandemic, suppression of public sector. Uh, increasingly, of course, the WHO even supported China's claim that there's no human to human transmission and, of course, even praised China for its management. The WHO officially adopted the Chinese government claim that there's no clear evidence of human to human transmission of the novel coronavirus identified in Wuhan, despite, of course, evidences. Uh, of course, when Australia and several countries like Taiwan and South Korea imposed a travel ban, they were even, of course, rep reprimanded by the president of the WHO. Uh, uh, the WHO also withheld uh, declaring the public health emergency in China as late as March. Of course, just efforts to control the rest of the world. However, by, of course, preventing uh, you know, this, the spread of information that there's an epidemic happening. And of course, the nature of this epidemic, uh, you have Chinese tourists, you have uh, to, uh, you know, internationals going to China, bringing the COVID-19 pa uh, pandemic throughout the world. So the rest of the world, however, is left fighting a losing battle. And we see it happening in the United States and elsewhere. I'll just go to my conclusion. So COVID-19 pandemic is the first major biological upheaval that has rocked the 21st century global side, and it will not be the last one. 
the CPP, the Communist Party of China, its local government official ordered a major blackout outbreak. Uh, China go, gave false statement to the WHO about the nature of COVID-19. Unfortunately, unfortunately, of course, the WHO plan to prevent the global spread of COVID-19. And this is because, again, like I mentioned earlier, a powerful and wealthy member state under an authoritarian system, China has undermined the WHO from fulfilling its essential role in mobilizing the global public health system against, of course, the spread of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, I'm now going to the, something very specific. My recommendation that we should consider, you know, pandemic as a non-traditional security issue, and we have to really be serious about health security. Current COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call for the Filipino nation to prepare themselves against future emerging infectious diseases that will ravage the country and, of course, the global society. This will require the Philippines to develop its public health infrastructure system and system as a critical strategic security asset that required public attention and legislation and funding. Using a term in security studies, we have to securitize pandemic. We have to take uh, seriously the notion of health security. So what will this entail? Number one, the Philippines should incorporate health security in the national security strategy. First time we came out with the national security strategy, this was in May 2018. It was simply focused on classic geopolitics and of course terrorism. There's no mention of emerging infectious diseases. The national defense and military strategies should also incorporate health security. So should the National Economic Development Authority five-year development plan. This is a you know budget discussion should be focused on how the, uh, the country would have to manage future emerging infectious diseases. Higher investment in the public health care system. We objective, of course, finding the right balance. And this is, of course, the challenge for the Philippines. We're not uh, only, we should not only be concerned about future. Uh, right now, of course, we have a lot of pandemics, endemics, tuberculosis, dengue fever, uh, polio. And of course, one thing that's very apparent since 2016, you have not only the revival of a lot of you know, powerful typhoons, you have the return of a number of epidemics in the country. Uh, like even missiles, right? You have a missile epidemic that happened in the West Coast of the United States. Later, it found out that it came from the Philippines because of the lack of vaccination triggered by the fear of the Denvaxia vaccine against, the, uh, against dengue. So it's also happening here. People are afraid of being vaccinated. Thus, you have the return of a number of infectious diseases. And of course, reemergence of previously controlled diseases like tuberculosis, bubonic plague, and even polio has returned to the Philippines. Incorporation of pandemic preparedness in the Philippines diplomacy. Uh, we have to include it in terms of our participation in ASEAN, that health security should be part of ASEAN's agenda. And more importantly, in terms of our alliance with the United States, that we have to broaden the alliance, not only in terms of addressing the, uh, you know, China's expansion in the South China Sea, counterterrorism, but also in dealing with pandemics. And also in terms of our agenda with our security partners, uh, like-minded security partners like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and India, we should have to incorporate health security in those security part partnership, the last. And of course, this is a long shot. This is really very, uh, it'll be very challenging for the current administration to adopt this policy, but this is a challenge. We have to support Australia and other EU countries and other like-minded country for pushing an investigation of the origin, not only the biological origin, but more so the social -politi political dynamics that has uh, that have facilitated the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic from China to the whole, you know, to the rest of the world, and the allegation, of course, that the WHO has become beholden to an influential and uh, to influential and influent countries, and of course, I'm referring to China. I end my pre uh, presentation here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Renan De Castro, for that very comprehensive. Uh, presentation as always and very gripping.
PowerPoints also, as always. Again, uh, uh, I recommend everyone to check Dr. De Castro's very good uh, special report that looks at the intersection of the rise of China on one hand, and also non-traditional security like the pandemic. And I really appreciate the fact that uh, both our speakers so far have emphasized the fact that we're not dealing with black swans. These are more like gray swans, These are or gray rhinos for that matter that we're facing nowadays. And there's a need for early warning systems, perhaps similar to what we had with tsunami. And I think one term that is becoming increasingly common in discussion nowadays is the concept of weaponized interdependence. So over the past generation, we have become more and more interdependent with China. And when China gets it wrong, or when China does not want to correct it when they get it wrong, the world pays a price. And I think things will get a little bit uglier or more contentious as economic numbers come out. So Vietnam and China are going to be two of the very few countries that will grow this year, while a lot of democracies are going to be hit very hard. Unfortunately, the Philippines and Indonesia are expected to suffer the most economic decline uh, over the past, next five years. I think for the Philippines, IMF projects 13% uh, growth differential decline and India at around 11%. So I expect more tensions and bitterness as there is going to be more investigation into the roots and the exact nature of where the crisis really sprung from. With that, let's go to the next uh, speaker. We have Bart Hogven. I hope I got that right, Bart. I mean, my name is also weird. Is that a Dutch name? Um, so I hope that I got it right. Uh, Bart uh, leads the cybersecurity uh, studies at the ASPI, Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And I really look forward also to his presentation because ASPI has done a fantastic job on the digital or tech cold war over the past few years. Uh, the floor is yours, Bart. <laughs> thank you, Richard, and, uh, and and good afternoon to everyone. Um, and thanks to the uh, the Swetbeis Adri Institute for um, um, the invitation to to speak uh, to you um, this morning. Still, I believe it is in in, in Manila, um, and it's actually great to be back in Manila, um, um, albeit uh, digitally and remotely. Um, Thanks um, also to the, the previous two speakers uh, who I think gave uh, two very uh, uh, comprehensive presentations, uh, obviously focused on uh, some of the health and health security issues that we're facing at the moment. Um, and while I was listening to the presentation that uh, Dr. Melly Caballero um, gave, I thought, well, if we would replace uh, health with, uh, with cyber or ICTs, um, she would actually be almost giving my presentation. Um, so I want to uh, um, uh, catch up on a few things that she mentioned um, at, the, at the end of her presentation when she said um, states are not in control, um, that there is a level of interconnectedness um, which is unforeseen, uh, or which, was, which is kind of unprecedented, uh, but also the need to look for multilateral inter governmental and, and probably what I would say multi-stakeholder solutions to tackle some of these very kind of um, wicked issues. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll try to strike a balance between what we heard earlier this morning about it, all the challenges that um, that we face as a region and the Philippines uh, at, at, at the center of that debate um, and try to look at what, what what is it that we actually can do? What What is it that we can do as, a, um, as, as an individual nation, but also as part of a very dynamic um, um, regional framework like ASEAN and the ASEAN Regional Forum. Um, so, I mean, I um, um, also listening kind of to the to earlier, to the previous speakers, um, I would definitely not consider uh, cyber anymore as an emerging security threat, uh, maybe not even as a traditional one anymore, but maybe we'll see kind of a post-traditional um, security threat. Um, but what I what I want to do kind of um, talk through is a little bit, let's say, about what's what's been happening, let's say, at the global stage, and and where does ASEAN and where do the Philippines sit, um, and maybe I can throw in throw in some, some examples from from Australia as well. So obviously, um, and this won't be kind of this will be an open door, I think, to to many uh, tuning in. Um, that the cyber domain and, and, and information and communication technologies are evidently an area, albeit maybe a relative new one, um, of, of strategic competition. And I think we see that um, in, in, let's say, everyday news as well. Um, and there is a strong uh, political security element to it. I think that's what we focus on this um, today. Um, but I think in countries like, uh, like the Philippines and, and more broadly in Southeast Asia, um, the economic and social dimensions of cyber and ICTs uh, maybe even more more dominant than kind of the security considerations. Um, 
um, which is dissimilar, I think, to some of the debates you, you might see um, in, in countries like the US or Europe or, or in Australia. Um, where, the, where the political and security dimension is, is I think, a bit, a bit stronger. That also ties to, I think, the, the point that the previous speaker brought up, let's say, about securitization. Um, and I think there is a tendency, at least a perception, that, um, that, um, that a country like Australia, with, with kind of partners among the Five Eyes communities, um, are trying to kind of securitize, or some people say militarize, uh, cyberspace. And I think that's not factually true, but there is definitely kind of a dominant perception, whereas um, ASEAN and ASEAN member states have been kind of fighting or, or kind of being cautioning the rest of the world against, let's say, militarizing um, cyberspace. Um, let me go back a couple of years um, when um, talking about, let's say, the role of information and communication technologies or cyberspace and the link to international and regional peace and security. Um, and I think what's in, it's interesting always to note that this was already brought up let's say, at the United Nations in the late 1990s, uh, not by Australia, not by the US, but in fact by the Russian Federation at the time. Um, they were the first to put this on the agenda of the United Nations. And this led to a, a first, um, what they called UN group of governmental experts to, to meet um, in, in 2004 and to look at kind of what are international and multilateral mechanisms to manage and contain uh, potential threats emanating from the use of information technologies um, in the context of international peace and security. So that already happened that's in, in, the, in the late 1990s and in the early 2000s. Um, now fast forward to, to, to today, um, what we currently have for, for those following kind of the, the global debate is that we've got two groups, two parallel groups, one initiated by the United States and its partners, um, and one initiated by Russia and China and their, and their allies, um, um, looking at kind of what are the international rules that would guide uh, the behavior of states in, in cyberspace. Um, and I think having those, those groups, those parallel groups, is very much a reflection of the strategic competition that, that was talked about earlier um, this morning. <clears throat> And I deliberately talk about parallel groups and not necessarily competitive groups um, for, I mean, for, 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 one, for, one, for one good reason, um, uh, while well, there's much more that can be said about it, is that both groups start from the same um, starting point. Um, and that is a global consensus around a number of elements um, that, um, that constitute what they call um, responsible behavior of states in cyberspace. And those four elements are, um, that international law applies to cyberspace as much as it applies in the kind of the offline and physical world. That there is a set of 11 um, norms, and I'm happy that Tom had brought up the, the term norms before. Um, uh, norms about, let's say, what states should and should not be doing. Um, they talk about confidence building measures and they talk about capacity building. I think the great thing is that all of these terms that I just mentioned um, appeared and popped up in previous conversations we had today and in I think all areas of international peace and security studies and debates. Um, so in that sense, kind of the cyber domain is nothing different really um, for many other um, security topics that, um, that, we, that we discuss. But looking at this, um, 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 and, uh, and I, I kind of want to kind of highlight um, why these two groups that I just referred to, so kind of the US initiated group and the Russia China initiated group, are at the moment kind of operating in parallel and not so much in competition. That's really because middle powers like the Philippines and through the ASEAN framework have really ensured and made, and made kind of a, the compelling case uh, for those groups to be complementary to one another. Now, deep diving into some of the norms, um, because if you are a nation and you look at how do I behave in cyberspace, um, what what do we need to do? What do other states expect for my nation to have in place or to do or not to do? And these norms actually describe mostly um, kind of positive steps that states should adhere to. Um, and then you're looking at, do you as a nation have a national computer emergency response team? Do you have a national team that looks after incidents and that's able to remedy uh, um, national crisis situations around a, an ICT incident or a cyber attack? Do you have the abilities as a government to engage in interstate cooperation? Do you have a unit within your Department of Foreign Affairs that deals with this? Do you have your 
um, like we have in the Philippines, um, the, uh, the, the, the Interagency Committee on Cybersecurity that is able to kind of work together with partners in the region. And do you have an ability as a government to form a whole of government approach because it ties together so many different elements um, when you look at ICTs, because it talks about, let's say, your national, cyber, your national security institutions, but also your, um, your, your tech companies that are operating uh, in your country, um, or everything that comes, that comes under, for instance, the Department of uh, Information, the ICT, uh, in, in, in the Philippine setting. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that um, um, there is uh, an incredible effort at the moment to kind of implement these kind of international good practices. And I would say that ASEAN is really in, in, a, in a unique position. And by, by saying ASEAN, I obviously, obviously also refer to uh, the Philippines to kind of shape this debate, shape this debate to inform um, the region and the rest of the world about what a country like the Philippines, given its particular socioeconomic context, considers good practice, but also to indicate where it needs additional assistance. Um, as I said before, that one, a particular element where uh, the international community has agreed to work on its own capacity building. Um, so um, to sum up there, um, when we look at um, what are the capabilities that individual nations, um, including countries like the Philippines, Australia, and other, other states in ASEAN are looking at, they're very much looking at kind of uh, establishing basic capabilities in terms of strategies and policies, about organizational cap capacities, but also the ability to fight cybercrime to implement uh, cyber defense measures from a national security point of view or from a, from a national defense point of view. Um, and also an ability to actually know what's going on on your own territory, um, let's say in the digital domain. And should there be a breach of something like an international norm, then a state has, has the ability to kind of address that um, and to hold other states or other organizations or criminals um, to account. And then there is still the question whether that's, um, that, that, that international responsibility is due to, let's say, a country's inability to prevent something from happening or whether there is really an unwillingness uh, and maybe a deliberate attempt to, bad, to do um, bad things. So um, that's just kind of in a nutshell uh, what I want to share. I think there, the good thing is there are lots of similarities between um, the previous speakers and kind of um, this area of this post-traditional area of of information and communication technologies. At the same time, um, what is encouraging is that, let's say within the technical community, which is largely not part of some of the national security dialogues like we're having here today, lots of, lots of that is happening on the ground, um, below the radar often. Uh, and I think there is a challenge for all of us to tie all of that together in a whole of nation, a whole of government approach, bringing in uh, a, a truly multi-stakeholder uh, commitment um, to this. Thank you, and, and looking forward to um, to, to questions and, uh, and further comments. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bart. I know there's so much to talk about about cybersecurity. And again, this is not an emerging threat. This is an evolving threat. And as we see uh, with election interference, with sharp power operations, with disruption of even industrial and uh, you know uh, basic critical infrastructure around the world, uh, cybersecurity is really a serious issue. And thank you so much for also highlighting the fact that you know, smaller countries, actually the Philippines is not small, it's, it's a middle-sized country and other larger countries also like Indonesia and the ASEAN as a whole have agency. They can do something about this. And I think it's not helpful for us to only talk about what's gonna happen with the Americans or the Chinese and the big powers, because this is a complicated issue. And we're talking about a very interdependent international cyber uh, system, including our ability to have this, this meetings in the midst of the pandemic. So I'm sure there are gonna be more question and answer later on. Thank you for compressing your presentation and a very complicated and multi-layered topic. So next, let's go uh, to, an, uh, to, our, uh, to another uh, top expert, this one on uh, international uh, maritime law and on fisheries issues in general in the Philippines, uh, Dr. Jay Batumbakal uh, from the University of the Philippines College of Law. Hello, thank you, Richard. And thank you to the Strap Day CBRI Institute for inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of speakers on this topic and it's actually rather far ranging. No? Uh, so uh, I'll just try to stick to three uh, main points. Now, given also my background uh, uh, on these uh, issues. Now, the pandemic combined with natural disasters have strained our maritime security and defense resources to their limits. 
our few ships and aircraft uh, meant for external defense have had to be diverted to humanitarian and disaster relief urgently needed by our people. And the fragmented geography of our archipelago underscores the need for sea and air capabilities required to traverse considerable waters and mountainous terrain. The COVID-19 pandemic and Typhoon Ulysses have given us previews of the increasingly difficult challenges that we face as new diseases and climate-induced uh, sea level rise and extreme weather events make disasters even more unpredictable in scope and impact. Uh, the practical requirements of civil defense must play an even greater role in determining the acquisition of uh, big ticket defense assets and give a premium to multi-mission capabilities. The DND AFP has already been moving in this direction with the acquisition of multi-mission vessels like the BRP Tarlac and BRP Davao del Sur and new helicopters like the Black Hawks. So it must continue to push in this direction in order to strengthen civil defense as well as external defense. The principal external security threats, however, are of a wide, of widely different types, uh, either uh, numerically and technologically superior China that in every respect still dwarfs the Philippine assets, resources, and capabilities, or uh, small-scale non-state intrusions uh, or intruders such as terrorist groups or transnational organized criminal organizations. Each of these two widely opposite demand, uh, each of these make widely opposite demands on our security forces. Now, China represents a complicated offshore and high-level defense problem. The establishment and development of a complex of military bases in the Spratly Islands region designed for power projection in and anti-access or area denial of the South China Sea inevitably represents a clear and existential threat not only to any prospective or future major power adversary for China, but also a present uh, problem, a present threat to the exercise of Philippine sovereign rights to its own resources in its exclusive own zone and continental shelf. But the traditional threat of an armed attack or invasion is not an immediate concern. For us, instead, it is the deployment of gray zone tactics to engage in maritime coercion backed up by a threat of naked use of force in order to secure uh, China's um, um, objectives, uh, which unfortunately mean denying us of access to our resources. Now, uh, non-state actors, including into the Philippine territory, whether terrorist fighters or human traffickers, contraband carriers, these represent a different, um, but maybe simpler problem these are operating at practically a micro scale in the vast area of our near shore waters and porous maritime borders. And they present more of a domestic or internal law enforcement problem uh, of uh, smuggling and illegal migration, but they have potentially large scale national security impacts as we've seen from the uh, um, battle at, uh, in Marawi uh, some years ago. Now both threats undoubtedly have maritime components no? and they are maritime in nature. The vectors are maritime in nature, and the activities uh, that bear, bear them take place on uh, widely different maritime scales. With limited resources, the Philippines cannot possibly address uh, both at the same time with the needed resources in an ideal manner uh, that, uh, that such uh, the, uh, threats deserve, especially in terms of assets to respond to incidents and activities when they take place. So this implies that the best investments in resource allocation uh, that we can make really are in surveillance, anticipation, and prevention. Uh, both threats need to be addressed by a comprehensive and broader scope of uh, maritime domain awareness system. According to most uh, um, literature, MDA, or sometimes it's also referred to as maritime situational awareness, uh, this is the effective understanding of any activity associated with the marine environment that could impact upon the security, safety, economy, or environment of a state. And this is actually one of the principal objectives of the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement signed in 2014, the development and enhancement of Philippine maritime domain awareness. Now, enhancing and developing MDA should still be the top priority of our security forces in capacity and capability building, especially the military and law enforcement services. But MDA capabilities must extend beyond the military orientation that currently uh, EDCA necessarily implies but it must extend uh, and expand into more open, multi-purpose and diver diversified uses. MDA does not serve only military objectives after all, but also law enforcement, and they can also be deployed for disaster management and environmental management. Even pandemic response, which can make use of the techniques and technologies 
of uh, human humanitarian and, and uh, assistance and disaster uh, relief uh, would benefit from MDA. So this would be a really strategic uh, uh, area. MDA has technological infrastructure management and policy components and there is a need to develop a comprehensive and integrated MDA system that enables the most efficient and cost-effective use of available technologies, creates and maintains the human resources needed to operate the system, and enhances scientific and evidence-based policymaking and decision-making so that our actions can be more purposive and cost-effective. Now, to date, the Philippines has the, uh, the basic components of such a system. Uh, this is in, in the National Coast Watch Center based in the PCG headquarters in Manila, supporting the National Coast Watch Council. Now, however, this system has yet to reach its full potential. Moreover, a significant portion of funding and equipment for the system has so far been provided by the United States through the Defense Threat Reduction Agency as part of its assistance to the Philippines. And so far, four facilities have been constructed under this program. Aside from the center in Manila, you also have stations in Palawan and Cebu and a training facility in Palawan. Now, uh, as I mentioned, MDA through this system is a strategic resource with multiple benefits and the Philippines must seriously invest in it in order to maximize its potential, not only for external defense, but also civil defense, law enforcement and a disaster response. Marrying and integrating the NCWC system with similar purposive uh, technologies and surveillance systems such as those developed by Project NOAA of the University of the Philippines for disaster management would enhance its potentials considerably. And it is vital that the National Coast Watch System be sustainably funded and operated by the Philippines and begin to, uh, and that the Philippines should begin to win this item from US defense cooperation support and instead make it a national uh, priority. Such support, uh, so this, in this way, U.S. defense cooperation support could also could then be directed to other equally pressing needs. It would be one of the most cost-effective and beneficial investments that the Philippines can make in its own capacity and capability building against all forms of external threat, both natural and non-made. Now, beyond the MDA, however, it's also obvious that the Philippines, is, as a smaller country with limited resources, needs to address huge gaps and power disparity present in its external security threat profile. While it can generate sufficient resources and, uh, and, and deploy assets to address threats posed by non-state actors, it can never have on its own and alone the necessary resources or assets to face up to China and China's activities, which currently and in the near future remain the only probable external security threat. Uh, apart from resources and assets, the capacity and capability that we need uh, immediately uh, and, and most uh, urgently is not more equipment, but rather more skills and strategies in defense diplomacy. Alliances and partnerships with like-minded states built around shared principles and a rules-based order are the only means of filling in the huge gaps in power and, and power disparity. The management of alliances and partnerships, however, require a very special skill set that combines diplomacy with defense sensibilities. Unfortunately, over the past decades, it's rather unfortunate that the Philippines on the whole has not gone beyond thinking of alliances as a primitive relationship defined by the simplistic formulae, either you're with us or against us, or uh, fight for me whenever I need you to. Much of the recurring debates about automatic response, unwanted conflict, imbalance in the alliance relationship, all of these spring from this rather dim view of alliance management. In the context of today's complex security environment, where the Philippines stands in the middle ground between competing powers, we need a new capacity and capability in defense diplomacy. This will entail an interdisciplinary and interdepartmental officer team that actively manages the alliance as a whole. This is more than the mutual defense board or the mutual security engagement board, which are essentially joint implementing mechanisms for the MDT, BFA, and EDCA, and are thus preoccupied with day-to-day -day administration of alliance activities. What we need uh, as a country is a higher level office and officials who actually engage in formulating and coordinating alliance policies and strategies on a continuing long-term basis, which will allow the alliances and partnerships to play their roles in their respective spheres of competence and coordinate them with the unilateral defense policies and activities of the country. We have seen from the previous presentations, the emergence of technologies uh, uh, available commercially or non-commercially and the rise of multiple challenges to national security, both traditional and non-traditional. 
And to date, our, our security alliances and partnerships have been founded on traditional or classical approaches and technologies. The current challenges that we now face, which include the pandemic response, go well beyond these. And thus we need to develop uh, a capacity and capability to level up our use and management of alliances and partnerships as well. If we are to ensure that they respond best to our own national security needs and not just our partners' interests and requirements. In our case, leveraging the Alliance Against Disasters, including the current pandemic, would be among our main priorities. So the opportunity for this was presented when DMD and DFA embarked on an MDA re MDT review just prior to the pandemic. And there were indications that the Philippines and US would level up their alliance work in the direction of how the US and Japan had been effectively working together. However, this was derailed this to abrogate the BFA and the COVID-19 pandemic. With the abrogation suspended, I hope that these discussions can resume and we can look forward to a more advanced and sophisticated alliance relationship, which is exactly what we need right now in our increasingly complex and challenging security environment. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay, uh, for that. Uh, well, I think it's the first time I've seen you reading a speech. That was a fantastic one. I look forward to a printed version of that. Perhaps we can forward to President Duterte and uh, President-elect Biden's team uh, as soon as possible. Thank you for providing us a survey of the overall legal and policy infrastructure we have to deal with this issue. It's not like we don't have a vision to deal with them. It's really an issue of bureaucracy, management, and leadership, but also the importance of tweaking our alliance with the United States on the level of VFA, MDT, among others, to also deal with both real emergent and evolving threats that we're facing in the realm of maritime security. I have a lot of questions for you, of course, uh, and issues on like fisheries and international law. And I think we'll have some time for question and answer later on. So thank you so much for that, Jay. Uh, I'm moving to our next speaker. I'm very interested to hear uh, General Emmanuel Bautista now that he's, um, you're, you're now out of the government, right, General? Uh, yeah. So General Bautista was the former AFP chief of staff. He oversaw the uh, prof professionalization of civil military relations. He also served as an undersecretary, uh, you know, in the Malacanang uh, under the Duterte administration. So he has served under multiple administrations. So he has indispensable views and insights into how the Philippines is dealing with uh, emergent, evolving, and real threats in the 21st century. Um, General Bautista, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, okay, so let me uh, take off from the uh, presentations of the previous speakers. There has just been a rich uh, discussion on uh, some non-traditional threats and uh, also, Dr. J uh, discussed the uh, the uh, geopolitical issues, and uh, let me uh, let me discuss uh, further the, those issues, the geopolitical uh, issues, uh, the security issues that uh, that uh, comes out out of this uh, geopolitical uh, rivalry. And uh, the keynote address of Secretary Lorenzana aptly framed the uh, geopolitical context of uh, this uh, rivalry. And let me take off from that. Uh, we all know that the, uh, the uh, geopolitical rivalry between the US and China has been uh, driving a lot of security issues uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And the uh, Indo-Pacific where this uh, geopolitical rivalry is now occurring. It is now the epicenter of strategic competition between the United States and uh, China, as uh, Prime Minister Morrison aptly stated. Now, uh, but what is the situation now uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific? Uh, we have a U.S.-led liberal order and uh, open economic regime, and this is backed up by U.S. overwhelming power projection capability. But we have a rising China who is challenging this uh, US-led liberal order and uh, is now developing its uh, armed, for armed forces, uh, specifically its uh, Navy. It's now uh, uh, bigger than the United States uh, Navy in terms of numbers. 
not necessarily in terms of capabilities. And in the Indo-Pacific, there are territorial disputes that uh, figure prominently in the geopolitical landscape. And these can be uh, sources uh, of uh, tension and may spark, in fact, the uh, conflict between the great superpowers. And uh, I'm specifically referring to the uh, China-India border dispute, the, the Senkakus, uh, Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Straits, and of course, uh, the South China Sea. And uh, we have also seen the emergence of uh, the Quad in uh, response to a growing Chinese assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, not just the, uh, the Quad, but also European powers. And we've seen uh, uh, United Kingdom, France, and even Germany now is speaking out on the issue of the South China Sea. Uh, note that in this uh, geopolitical region, the Indo-Pacific, uh, the center of it is Southeast Asia and the South China Sea. And in the center of that center is the Philippines. Uh, that, that's where we are. So. Uh, going to Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia geostrategically located as, at the center of the Indo-Pacific uh, along the waterways to the west. And ASEAN centrality remains to be the norm, norm in regional dynamics for how long uh, we will see. And if uh, ASEAN can sustain that centrality, if ASEAN can sustain its cohesiveness. The South China Sea is likened to the Asiatic and Mediterranean. The uh, Asiatic and Mediterranean is the integrated waters of the uh, South China Sea, but also includes the East China Sea, the Sea of Japan, and the Yellow Sea. And these are vital to the uh, history, identity, trade uh, of Eastern Asia as the Mediterranean is to Europe. Note that the uh, workshops of the world, the factories of uh, China, Taiwan, Japan, Vietnam, and Southeast Asia, on which the global trading network depends are, lo are located here in the littorals of the uh, uh, South China Sea. And the control of what we term as the Asiatic Mediterranean means control of Asia and Asia's productive and trading capacities. Now, the Philippines, as I said, uh, in the middle of it, a geostrategic location in the middle of the South China Sea and the Pacific, but also in a military lingo, it's a term as a key terrain. A key terrain is a feature, the possession of which will give a marked advantage over your adversary. So uh, this is important to either of the uh, adversary to be able to control the key terrain. Note that uh, the Philippines not only is along the uh, first island chain, but also uh, the access to and from the South China Sea from the Pacific are through the uh, choke points in the Philippine archipelago. And I'm referring to the uh, Bashi Channel and Batanes uh, in the north, and we have San Bernardino Strait and Surigao Strait uh, in the east. Uh, passing to um, Mindoro and uh, Balabac Strait. Uh, and down south, you can pass through uh, Cebuto Strait and even Basilan Strait. Now, the PCA ruling of 2016 has defined uh, our entitlements in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, the Philippines remains to be a U.S. treaty ally, but we all know that the Philippine president has sought closer ties uh, with China. Now, uh, given this uh, geopolitical context, uh, what are the uh, ramifications for us? The, this uh, rivalry has implications for the Philippines. Uh, one, we are, because we have a mutual defense treaty with the US, uh, but also China presents an economic opportunity for the Philippines. And uh, more importantly, as I uh, discussed earlier, we are a key terrain in this uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region that is important to both uh, the uh, rivals in the region. 
and China has, uh, in fact, uh, seized and militarized features in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea. And, and this uh, territorial hegemony has directly affected the Philippines. The geopolitical rivalry aside, our main issue with China is its uh, 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 transgression of Philippine sovereignty and sovereign rights. And in the process is employing gray zone strategy uh, against the Philippines. And uh, this uh, gray zone strategy uh, encompasses uh, a lot of uh, uh, activities more than the military. Now, what are the challenges for us given this? Uh, first, first challenge is to assert our sovereignty and sovereign rights, but uh, being careful to avoid armed conflict. No, nobody wants armed conflict. It is against uh, our constitution also. And uh, therefore, we need to, by all means, avoid armed conflict. But at the same time, we need to assert our sovereignty and sovereign rights. Uh, secondly, another balancing act that we have to do is availing of Chinese investments. We need the investments for our economy, but we have to safeguard our national security in the process. We cannot compromise our national security. Uh, a third challenge for us is to manage our relations with both the US, our ally, and uh, China, given the evolving geopolitical rivalry. And of course, we need to protect our environment. Uh, given this, uh, how do we prepare for the uncertainty that this brings, that this uh, rivalry and its ramifications for us brings? Uh, in order to do that, we need to develop our national capabilities uh, in order to achieve national resilience, achieve a credible defense posture, and address China's gray zone strategy. But more importantly, demonstrate the national will to uphold our sovereignty and sovereign rights, that we are willing to stand up for our rights in the West Philippine Sea. Now, how do we develop national capabilities? Uh, I, uh, there are two ways. Uh, the first is to strengthen the instruments of national power. We need a more comprehensive uh, development of capabilities, not just military, because the gray zone strategy involves all of these uh, non-military means, uh, including economic, uh, political, uh, and other aspects of uh, influencing or imposing your will uh, on the other side. Now, in terms of uh, diplomatic, political, legal, uh, there are many things that we can do. We need to capacitate our, our, our uh, diplomatic uh, abilities uh, to maintain our multilateral linkages uh, with us many nations as uh, we, we need to. Uh, in fact, we should not be making enemies, but making friends uh, with all of the nations of the world in order to be able to, to uh, advance our interests. Mm. We, we need to, as I mentioned, demonstrate political will and the resolve that we stand firm by our sovereignty and sovereign rights. Uh, uh, as a matter of uh, principle. And uh, perhaps uh, we need to prepare also uh, legal options uh, subsequent to our uh, victory at the, uh, the Hague Tribunal. And uh, th this includes uh, uh, legislations, uh, exploring other legal options uh, and uh, uh, other international uh, submissions to relevant international bodies. Uh, for instance, we need to, to uh, advance our archipelagic sea lanes law, maritime zones bill, and even extended continental shelf. Uh, 
on the information uh, realm, uh, we, we, we have to decisively fight the information war that is going on. We have to advance the Philippine narrative and refute the Chinese narrative. And uh, uh, I appreciate the private sector for taking the cudgels on fighting this information war. We have the likes of uh, uh, Justice Carpio and even uh, Jay Batumbakal uh, leading this effort. We, of course, we need to strengthen our economy to avail of uh, economic opportunities without compromising our national security. And we need to diversify our, uh, so that we are not dependent only on one. And more importantly, we need to avoid economic capture. Note that China's BRI is as much a political instrument as it is an economic initiative and one uh, where uh, China increases its political influence over policy trajectories of South China Sea states uh, in the context of its claim. And uh, also very important is protecting our strategic assets and strategic industries. We need to safeguard them. We, we need national policies on them. Uh, of course, uh, we have to upgrade our military, the, the objective is a credible defense, uh, credible deterrence. And this is achieved both by uh, modernizing our armed forces, but also strengthening and broadening our alliances. Uh, while, we, uh, while we develop na national capabilities, we have to complement this with the alliances and the partnerships. And also we need to uh, to uh, strengthen our linkages with uh, international institutions such as ASEAN and the United Nations. But uh, while we do that, we need to also engage China in constructive dialogue. Uh, the, the purpose, primary purpose is to prevent conflict and to peacefully resolve uh, our issues. And with that, let me conclude uh, by saying that uh, we are witnessing a highly competitive great power game in the Indo-Pacific area that affects all of us. So as Filipinos, what do we value as a nation and how do we situate ourselves? And what about the rest of the free world? For the Philippines, the West Philippine Sea dispute is not solely a geopolitical issue between the US and China. More importantly for us, the West Philippine Sea dispute is a result of China's transgression of Philippine sovereignty and sovereign rights. And therefore we need to push back and defend against China's creation strategy. And finally, the militarization of uh, Chinese held features uh, in the West Philippine Sea and resultant damage to the environment has profound security implications for all of us and therefore we need to prepare for this uncertain future. So thank you very much. Sir. And uh, I welcome any clarifications or questions. Maraming salamat, uh, General Bautista. It's good to hear you, especially now that you're a quote unquote private citizens. Uh, and I'm sure you're gonna also take up the cudgels to push for a better uh, protection of our basic rights and legitimate sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea. So welcome aboard <laughs> in that sense when uh, given the fact that you have served in the military and under different administration, your views and insights are extremely helpful. And we look forward to having you more in our discussions in the coming months and years. Uh, Madam Salamat, sir, uh, which is, of course, uh, also a segue to our last but not the least speaker. I just want to make sure. Yes, uh, the, uh, Rear Admiral Romel Ong, who also uh, has served a long time in the military, a very decorated career. Uh, in the Philippine Navy, and since uh, retiring from service, he has also been a major voice in terms of informing the public on the importance of having a modern Navy and how to defend our rights. So uh, looking forward also to your presentation, uh, Admiral Ong, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Richard. Let me share my screen first. In the interest of time, I will just slide, uh, run fast with my slide uh, to keep pace with the time limit. Now, most of this has been discussed before earlier. 
uh, and I'll just run through it. Now, from where I'm standing, I'm looking at at least four relevant scenarios that we need to address. First one is yung very contested sea control over the South China Sea. Second would be the developments in Southeast Asia. Third would be looking at the evolution of the quadrilateral partnership between uh, US, Australia, Japan, and uh, India. And last one is uh, looking at tensions within China itself. And of course, uh, their, their, uh, their dynamic with, between China and India in the Indian Ocean and in their uh, border. Uh, looking at the geopolitical perspective uh, from where China is standing, from, from China's perspective, sea control can be uh, evidence in these uh, slides. And uh, when we talk of sea control, we're not only talking of the East China Sea and South China Sea per se, but we also need to look at the uh, sea lines of communication or the strategic straits where uh, international traffic passes through. And I've identified some, uh, Senkaku, Luzon Strait, Bala uh, Panatag Shoal, Mindoro Strait, Balabak, James Shoal, Natuna, and of course, Malacca Strait. Now, as far as the Philippines uh, national security is concerned, uh, and looking at it from the instruments of uh, power, uh, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, what I'm trying to point out is that we always focus on the gray zone tactics of the South China Sea, but the other components of instruments that uh, China is employing are also uh, relevant in, in, the, in, in, in terms of its synergy with its military uh, activities in the South China Sea. And this is something that we shouldn't be discounting. Now, given those challenges, the notional defense posture that uh, we need to adopt from a military perspective would be looking at it from the point of view of full government approach and uh, other uh, capable, requisite capabilities that we need to develop to be able to address it in the different aspects or different domains of warfare. Now, specifically, in terms of the whole of government approach, uh, we need to protect our government and businesses and we need to develop capabilities in terms of countering influence operations, countering disinformation, and protecting our cyberspace. And I foresee that these all three concerns will converge two years from now. Second is we need to develop our sea control capability to secure our sea lines of communication. We have seven gateways or seven slots that we need to secure and we need to be able to understand what's happening in those areas in terms of maritime domain awareness and of course having the ability to respond to challenges that comes on in those areas in terms of interdiction capability we need to develop a capacity for island defense and i'm looking at three areas that need to be defended uh, batanes puswanga and balabak island groups now, if you ask me what is the potential for a Chinese physical invasion of uh, those islands in the current context, I would say zero. But if, we, if you ask me what is the possibility of a Chinese investment in terms of uh, building a seaport or airport in those areas, I would say the potential is very likely. We need to develop our sea denial capability in the West Philippine Sea to establish a buffer on that on the West Philippine Sea and as, as well as provide a deterrent effect. We have already identified the technical solution for that problem. Uh, however, uh, funding is always an issue, uh, particularly now with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course the impact on the economy and the economy's uh, impact on defense spending. In, it, in terms of maritime security, we need to work more with the other law enforcement agencies of the Philippines, particularly the Coast Guard, in developing interoperability so that we can jointly have sustained presence at sea and uh, using coordinated patrols. We need to develop strategic deterrence and one way of doing that is working with ASEAN. Uh, I think in the past few weeks, uh, our Navy was able to present its proposal to the ASEAN Navy Chiefs meeting for two items. One is the development of an ASEAN Maritime Task Force 
and second is a, a networking all the maritime domain awareness capabilities of the uh, uh, coastal states in ASEAN, working together to create a comprehensive regional maritime operating picture. And of course, strategic deterrence comes in the form of a better relationship, as uh, G Dr. J has said, better alliance management with our allies and partners so that we can work together. Our takeaways for our these, one, I think the more compelling threat to the country is Chinese influence operations, particularly of the Chinese Communist Party directed towards our government. Second, the China's strife fleet, the Navy, Coast Guard, and militia are basically its enablers for its sea control strategy. And we hope that under a US, uh, under a Biden presidency, we have a more coherent multilateral approach to addressing the South China Sea issues uh, in the coming years to come. And lastly, in terms of the Philippines, we have zero capability and no buy-in to address influence operations and disinformation in the current political context. Second, given the current capabilities of the country, our most viable option to, is to work with our allies and partner states to strain strategic deterrence in terms of systems and logistics interoperability. That is the most doable uh, option uh, we can perform. Third, Philippines should leverage its geostrategic strength and mitigate it weak its weaknesses in terms when it, it tries to develop new capabilities. And lastly, we need to consider new technologies. Uh, our concern is that we might be acquiring things or items today that when they are delivered two, three, four, four years from now, they're already obsolete. And we need to step up the plate and look at other technologies like AI, robotics, and others uh, so that uh, our current systems, so that the systems that we get in the future will still be relevant to the emerging threats. Uh, that ends my uh, presentation. Thank you and uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Admiral Ong, for once again giving us a very important reminder of the kind of threats we're facing, especially as we head towards our own election season. As some of you may know, uh, the other month, actually, Facebook had to shut down, I think, Um, hi, everybody. I think I'll just give Richard a minute. I think he might be facing some technical difficulties. Right when he was talking about Facebook shutting down some pages. There we go. I think I was, uh, <laughs> I was, I was a victim of sharp power operations myself. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, just about to say that. Yeah, as you may know, Facebook had to shut down close to 100 accounts space in Fujian in China. And uh, of course, some of them had to do with propagating pro-China line in South China Sea, Hong Kong and Taiwan. But a good number of them had to do with what could be China's preferred candidates uh, for the 2022 elections. And you may guess who we are talking about here. So I think we already have clear evidence uh, based on the latest crackdown of Facebook. Uh, that sharp power operations are real, that this is not just in the case of Taiwan, this is not just in the case of potential Singapore or the US, but also in the case of the Philippines. I also, um, I was also troubled when the other year I had uh, uh, an interview with James Jimenez, the spokesman for Collect, and I asked him whether similar to the US and other countries, whether, do we ha whether we have any kind of foreign financing um, legislation or an oversight committee. And it seems from what I gather, we don't have any of that. So it's just not a matter of zero capability. It's zero foresight and zero legislation. And I think that's immensely troubling and just shows the sorry state of our national security strategy thinking. Now, with that in mind, um, we have a lot of speakers, great speakers, and um, we have many questions coming in. So I want to make sure that uh, each speaker gets a chance to build Uh, 
mustard. Um, looks like uh, we are facing some technical difficulties again. Just give me one minute. Okay. In the meantime, maybe I can take over a bit. Uh, can you hear me, Paco? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, Perfect. And right. last one. I, you know, I'll not talk about in sharp power operations anywhere. Maybe this will help out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Could we go? Um, so maybe I'll start again with Mela. Uh, I suppose Mela is still there. Yeah, um, I mean, you're an ASEAN expert and you have been discussing non traditional security issues for quite some time. Based on your understanding of the current play of the land, what do you think can ASEAN, both as an organization and also on a minilateral level among key countries within ASEAN with capabilities and interests, what can it do to deal with the non traditional uh, security threats, including uh, the pandemic and other related threats that we're facing? And then we can go one by one. And then with uh, Dr. Ren and De Castro, um, you know, you have highlighted very rightly the intersection between the rise of China, its authoritarian system, and the kind of major crisis we're facing in the world. Now, one model nation everyone talks about is Taiwan and democracy that is expected to grow also economically this year. I think the only democracy I can imagine ne next to Vietnam and China, which are not democracies. And we know Taiwan is not part of the World Health Organization because they have been kicked out by the Chinese, essentially, and that's where we see in the forest influence of WHO. But we have seen that the proactiveness of Taiwan, both on the public health front and also in pushing back against China's serpentism, has created more or less a success story, especially under the Tsai Ing-wen administration. Uh, what do you think about this? What are the lessons for especially countries like the Philippines, given this intersection between non-traditional and traditional security? Yeah, it really looks like Richard is having some connectivity problems. Uh, but he was able to get a couple of questions out there. So I was hoping Dr. Melly and Dr. RDC, if you could try to answer these questions that Richard posed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th there was a question on, on ASEAN and, um, on, and how they're actually how this regional body can actually be a very useful vehicle framework for addressing a range of um, non-traditional security and traditional security issues as well. And, you know, it, it actually, that, that could be a whole topic of conversation in a conference because, um, you know, it, it actually quite, uh, it actually has done quite a lot in dealing with these issues. Just when it comes to just, you know, in the first place, uh, uh, setting the agenda for this, for these issues, you need a platform where many of these issues can be discussed at, uh, you know, by different countries, by different actors, and being able for each country, regardless of your big or small, to be able to bring in and, and raise some of the problems that you face. Now, uh, if you want to break it down into, for example, um, what it has done to deal with the pandemics. Um, it actually has not been bad if, if you look at the kind of um, discussion and technical cooperation going on. Uh, I'd like to, to bring your attention to a statement by uh, Dr. David Heyman. He used to be the WHO representative to deal with the SARS crisis. And when he was speaking about COVID, he raised a very important point, and that is that in spite of the bilateral tensions that are happening between China and the US and all of these problems that we have, uh, you name it, you know, whether you're from Northeast Asia or, or South Asia, there's a very strong technical cooperation that's ongoing to deal with the pandemics. And this is why when you look at, for example, uh, the kind of information sharing that's taking place in ASEAN, the, inf the, the kind of a capacity building measure, even down to beefing up your laboratories for epidemiological testing. Uh, th there's a lot of frameworks that, that, are, that are happening and, and where you really bring in your, your, you know, your technical people coming together. The, uh, the, uh, in the area of, of food security, you know, in, in terms of technology, for example, even down when you talk about dealing with, for example, maritime security, there are frameworks and that has been mentioned by the speakers uh, earlier on. So ASEAN becomes a very important framework, not just for uh, information sharing, but capacity building. 
right? And when I talk about vaccines, for example, one of the things that it preoccupies many of the economic officials and health officials in the region is how you could actually avail of the existing vaccines that are going to be rolled out in the market, given the fact that some of the big powers, you know, uh, the U.S. and have already um, uh, have already have their exclusive um, orders, and and because they have more resources, then they can get, of course, access to more vaccines. So this is the conversation that's taking place, right? And um, and as far as addressing this travel ban that we have in the region, one of the important uh, ideas and policies that are being fleshed out is to have a common protocol when it comes to travel. Right, because domestic uh, and regional tourism is very important. There are some countries, for example, here in Singapore, that don't have a domestic travel at all. You only have Singapore and you get out, it's already Malaysia. So having a common travel protocol, having a common health protocol, this is all very important that can be done at the regional basis. Because as we all know, national capacities in certain countries are limited. Right? So it provides all of this assistance, not just among themselves, but using ASEAN as a platform, you're able also to tap the expertise and the resources of big powers like, for example, the US, China, and, and you know, the European Union and Japan and South Korea. So spending time right, in, in attending and, 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 uh, um, and participating in these meetings and sharing whatever um, information or the sharing of policy thinking itself is very important. You know, I was very pleased uh, to, to listen to the discussion on, you know, the concerns of the South China Sea, because when you think about what is keeping, you know, the ASEAN countries in coming up with, uh, with, uh, with common statements, for example, and the extent to which some of these statements and concerns from ASEAN member countries in the Philippines, I don't know to what extent that has actually been transmitted at the ASEAN level, right? So you have a lot of potential um, that, the, that the ASEAN can actually do. And uh, given the time, and if we have the time, we could actually outline them. But the fact of the matter is this is part of the multiple uh, pathways, if you like, that a country like the Philippines can take in addressing a multiplicity of security challenges that it cannot do alone, right? And in this case, regional uh, regional frameworks also sh help in the shaping of international norms and laws. When you talk about pandemic preparedness, for example, you, that you help countries, you know, meet the requirements of the WHO when it comes to the international health regulation, mandatory reporting of natural disasters. So, I mean, I, I don't want to monopolize this, but there are many things that can be done at the ASEAN level for the simple reason that you're actually pooling resources and capacities together. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm a, I'll address a question raised by Richard regarding Taiwan. Yeah, I have no disagreement with you among the li like-minded states in the region Taiwan offers a very good model in terms of governance, in terms of dealing with the pandemic, also in terms of how we deal with a very powerful neighbor like China. But unfortunately, uh, we're ignoring each other. Uh, we have now a government that basically adopts in, to you know, in toto the Chinese position that Taiwan is simply a province. And you have instances, of course, when you even have this current government, like the presidential spokesperson insulting Taiwan over the issue on, on OFW in Taiwan, who the government was trying to punish just because he, you know, he criticized President Duterte in his face in her Facebook account. Then immediately you have the reaction of the presidential spokesperson saying that you know we cannot uh, we cannot have him back to the Philippines because Taiwan is a province of China. So how can we have a very good relation with Taiwan when you know this current government simply accepts China's position that Taiwan is simply a province of China? So. That's my, you know, uh, that's the tragedy in terms of looking at our relation with our nearest neighbor, which is of course Taiwan. Yeah, thanks, thanks, RDC. By the way, uh, this is Paco Pangalangan, the executive director of Stratbase ADRI. I, I am in contact with Richard, and he's going to try again. We'll give him one he's more back. chance. He's back. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to give him one more chance to ask a few questions of our speakers, Richard. Yeah, I'm just going to put them all together very quick before I get caught off again for some weird reason. Uh, yeah, General Bautista and Admiral Ong, you have served some time in the government and you're familiar with the situation in terms of arms acquisition and the bureaucratic issues. 
Uh, what is your assessment of the Horizons project? We're supposed to be in phase three already. There has been a lot of delays in phase two. What have been the gains and the significant drawbacks and how do you think we can uh, solve that? And then of course to Bart on the cybersecurity issue, what are the concrete and proposals or low hanging fruit for countries like the Philippines to deal with the new and evolving threats that we're facing aside the fact that we have to also assert ourselves and kind of put our own ideas on the table and not leave it to the great powers. And lastly to Jay, um, what, is, what do you think is the relevance of the fact that the major three European powers jointly have submitted uh, a note of verbal to United Nations on the Arbitral Tribunal Award? We see Malaysia, Indonesia also raising the issue quite openly in their formal statements and note of verbal to United Nations. Are we seeing a turning of the tide? And you think that may explain why even President Duterte had to take a tougher stance on, on the issue? And where do you think the legal, the on clause aspect of the South China Sea issue will go? Okay, I, I, I did my job, Paco. So <laughs> you saved the day in case the Chinese come in again. Thank you. Mm. Maybe uh, Bart first. Is, is, is Bart around? I am indeed. Sorry. Yeah, I was waiting for someone to, <laughs> to take yeah, the floor so first. For, yeah, yeah, I'm yep. just following the, the order. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, no worries. No worries. Uh, well, thanks for your question. Thanks for uh, uh, all the other presenters for some very thought provoking and interesting um, <clears throat> uh, presentations. Let's say across a whole range of, uh, of, uh, of topics. You were asking about what's, what's the low hanging fruit for a country like the Philippines yeah. um, in, in terms of um, establishing its kind of cyber defense posture or or, or in cyber security um, grid large. Um, <clears throat> now I don't think there is a uh, let's say a, a, a set answer, but but if if I would um, give let's say a hint at an answer for where where where, um, um, where, where a country like the Philippines could focus on is kind of looking at uh, what are international good practices. And I in my in my uh, talk I, I talked about the international uh, norms of uh, responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And I think if you drill down into the, what these norms imply, um, they drill down to a, a number of very concrete things. One is have um, a national agency which is assigned responsibility to look after cybersecurity. And obviously in, uh, in the Philippines, I think the national, um, uh, the national um, computer emergency response team was, was reinstated earlier this year. Um, so kind of that's the nucleus and, and the, uh, of, of, let's say, uh, central coordination within, um, within government, but also with industry and, and other sectors of, of the economy. So expanding and building the maturity of an organization like that, and also including that in the kind of international networks. Furthermore, um, I would say point out two things. One is probably related to um, within the mandate of, of DICT, which is really kind of helping other governments, but also critical infrastructure in, in looking what's the, key, the current risk profile and see what kind of risk management uh, measures can be taken. And I know that's partly in progress, um, but I think that's say the extent of that probably um, will need to be kind of expanded just given the scale and the size of, um, of your economy in your country. Um, and finally, um, um, building on the point um, I also made during my speech is, is how do you strengthen your internal government processes? So for instance, through the existing, um, uh, uh, what's it called, the, the National Interagency Task Force on Cybersecurity, which is with the Office of the President, is, is really, uh, can that body kind of tie together um, um, tactical analysis of, of developments in the region, bringing that together with information and analysis and intelligence that's coming through law enforcement, through the intelligence services, as well as through uh, the AFP, um, and match that with broader policy considerations and eventually maybe um, to certain um, kind of uh, public or, or political decisions to, um, um, to, to, to go left or right. Um, and, and finally, I think um, low-hanging fruit uh, is very much uh, being part of the conversations, both in, in New York, in the UN, where I know the Philippine delegation uh, through DFA is very active, but also within ASEAN. And I think there is still, um, right. I think, some, um, some, some, some ground to be won is how do, you, how do we kind of uh, encourage um, um, the city of Philippine government to be even more active and also comfortable and confident in engaging in these debate um, within ASEAN too. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Jay? Yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I've been distracted by some office. No problem. <laughs> Zoom life. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, what was the question again? I'm really sorry about this. It's yeah, I mean, <laughs> just very quickly, I mean, yeah, just going back to the arbitration award and all, because we have been on top of this for quite some time. I just want to take uh, your, your view on, you know, the fact that you have European countries having a joint submission on the, uh, you know, the, the nota verbale that, you know, mentions the arbitral tribunal award quite clearly. Indonesians, Malaysians have also done that over the past year in their own separate nota verbale. Is that kind of a game changer? Is that putting more pressure on the Philippine government to get its act together and President Duterte to get tougher on this issue? Yeah. It's not so much a game changer in the sense that uh, what, what's been happening really is that uh, the different countries are making their positions known in order to ensure that they will not be portrayed as having acquiesced to China's stated positions, you know, which were uh, transmitted through this, this process. You know? So it's like um, um, just to make sure, you know, uh, in terms of the uh, context, I mean, everybody knows uh, what the various positions are uh, that have been maintained by these countries. Uh, if at all, the, the biggest benefit from it would be on the part of the Philippines, the uh, assurance that there is support for its positions vis-a-vis -vis China. And then for the Southeast Asian countries as well, uh, they can actually now uh, fully state that there is no support at all for China's position. And legally, there is no way by which China can claim any basis in international law, even if they resort to say to invoking general international law. There is nothing there that uh, supports uh, China's legal position. In fact, what is on record is total rejection of China's uh, uh, legal position. So that's really the, the thing there. But uh, it's not so much a game, a major game changer in the sense that in the first place, uh, China's legal position really has, has not really been uh, garnering uh, any external support. So this uh, actually just uh, confirms it and, and expresses it formally in these notes verbals. Thank you very much. Uh, and General Bautista and Admiral Ong, maybe some of your views as former insiders and now kind of outsiders on what are we getting right and wrong with our modernization program? Because it's, it's, it's a mixed baggage, right? So what are the positives, glass half full and empty? And what are your recommendations as we enter the phase three of the Horizons uh, modernization program? Thank you, Richard. Uh, the, the modernization program has been uh, uh, hindered by a lot of problems uh, over time, historically. Uh, the, the most important is the financial uh, issues, the financial crisis, and then now the COVID-19 crisis uh, dealt a big blow to our modernization program. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, I think uh, there is, uh, we need a national resolve to really support the capability development of uh, our armed forces. That, that remains to be one thing, uh, uh, starting from our political elite, the realization that we need to invest in uh, defense and security. Uh, the, the norm is 2% of uh, GDP. Uh, most countries uh, invest 2% of their GDP in uh, defense, but uh, that is not happening here. We're just a little over 1% of uh, G GDP devoted for defense and security. We need to do better than that. Uh, and the third issue is the consistency of policy and strategy over time. And we have seen a lot of inconsistency. Every time we change administrations, uh, there is a change in uh, policy uh, with regards to uh, not only the modernization program, but uh, on many issues. Uh, so we need to institutionalize it, no? Institutionalize. Yes, yes. But uh, having said that, uh, I uh, there are two aspects of uh, developing a credible defense posture. The, the first is the modernization program, upgrading our national capability. But secondly, uh, it is also achieved through our alliances. Uh, and uh, if we find 
difficulty in developing national capability, then we should uh, leverage our alliances uh, because th these two things, uh, the capability of our armed forces and our alliances are the components of a credible uh, defense, of a credible uh, deterrence. So we, we need to work on these two things. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think President Ramos called that interdependent foreign policy, not just independent foreign policy. Leverage our alliances. Thank you very much for that. And Admiral Ong. Uh, thank you, Richard. Just two points. One, uh, I, th I think we need to break out of the mindset of the guns versus battery dichotomy. Right. Uh, and th I think that's driving the underinvestment in defense spending. Right. Second is we need to focus more on uh, uh, research and development. Uh, internal research and development, so that uh, 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 at some at some point at the end of the tunnel, our own economy can be is able to capacitate itself to actually produce the munitions or the requirements of the armed forces, rather than uh, get acquiring it from abroad. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much on that, uh, Admiral Ong and. I'm sure there's a lot to talk about, but Paco is already, uh, Paco is the boss and now you're going to be in charge. And uh, thank you very much for that, Paco. And let me apologize. Uh, I think I got it right at first. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think Dr. Meli, uh, sorry, I said I made it Meli. Apparently it's Meli is the correct one. So apologies, Meli, again, for wrongly self-correcting myself. Thank you. And thank you very much to the panel. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Richard, thank you for to our speakers at this point. Uh, now that the open forum has been closed, um, we would like to turn it over to Professor Manhit uh, to introduce uh, Justice Scarpio for the for the closing remarks. Um, uh, however, Professor Manhit, okay. In the interest of time, I shall take it upon myself to. <laughs> The, to give myself the honor of introducing our, our uh, Justice Carpio, uh, former Senior Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the Philippines, who will be giving our closing remarks. Um, Justice Carpio's personal advocacy to protect and preserve Philippine territorial and maritime sovereignty, specifically in the West Philippine Sea. In 2015, the DFA sponsored a world lecture tour of the South China Sea dispute, where he presented the Philippines' historical and legal case on the dispute before think tanks and universities in 30 cities covering 17 countries. In 2017, he published a book entitled The South China Sea Dispute, Philippine Sovereign Rights and Jurisdiction in the West Philippine Sea. Ladies and gentlemen, um, our friend of the Institute and our former senior associate justice, Antonio Carpio, sir. Ooh. Thank Justice you. Carpio. A pleasant yeah. day to everyone. I wish to thank the ADR Institute and the Bauer Group Asia for inviting me to give the closing remarks to this very interesting discussion. The Philippines has been drawn to the regional security concerns in the Indo-Pacific primarily because of the overlapping claims, both territorial and maritime, in the South China Sea among six states, China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia. However, Indonesia's dispute with China is only a maritime dispute, not a territorial dispute. The territorial dispute involving tiny islands and rocks in the South China Sea occupies less than 5% of the total area of the South China Sea. The maritime dispute covers the wider remaining areas of the South China Sea. The maritime dispute involves ownership of critical natural resources, fish, oil, gas, and other minerals that can be found in the seabed of the South China Sea. There is no international tribunal that has compulsory jurisdiction over the territorial dispute. The only way for the territorial dispute to be settled is for the disputant states to voluntarily submit the territorial dispute to arbitration. China, however, is unwilling to do so and thus the territorial dispute will go on and on indefinitely. Nature, however, may intervene to settle the territorial dispute. By the end of this century, sea level rise due to climate change is estimated to be at least one meter. And 
in the next century, an additional one to two meters more. This will submerge all the tiny island, islands and rocks in the South China Sea. The submerged islands and rocks in the Spratlys will form part of the EEZ of the Philippines if within 200 nautical miles from the coastline of the Philippines, or will form part of the extended continental shelf of the adjacent coastal states if they lay, lie beyond the Philippine EEZ. In the meantime, the claimant state should declare the Spratlys a marine protected area because the Spratlys are the breeding ground of fish in the South China Sea. The number one beneficiary will be China, which, take, which takes at least 50% of the annual fish catch in the South China Sea. A marine protected area in the Spratlys, jointly managed by the claimant states, will greatly lessen the territorial the tension arising from the territorial dispute. The maritime dispute in the West Philippine Sea between the Philippines and China has been settled with finality by the July 12, 2016 arbitral ruling, which declared that China's nine dash line cannot serve as basis to claim any of the waters or resources in the West Philippine Sea. While this arbitral ruling is binding only between the Philippines and China, the ruling, the ruling now constitutes a subsidiary source of international law. If a similar arbitration between Vietnam and China or between Malaysia and China takes place, the nine dash line of China will most likely meet the same ignominious fate. Thus, the settlement of the maritime dispute in the South China Sea, the most intractable, intractable maritime dispute in the world, will eventually be settled in accordance with the law of the sea, in particular, UNCLOS. While China in the past has refused to abide by the arbitral ruling, recent developments indicate that there may be light at the end of the tunnel. Last November 2018, the Philippines and China signed a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, to cooperate in exploiting oil and gas in the West Philippine Sea under the service contract system of the Philippines. Last August 2019, the Philippines and China signed the Terms of Reference, or TOR, to implement the MOU. A third and final agreement, a commercial one, should have been signed last March 2020 in Manila between China National Offshore Company or Sinuk and Forum Energy, the holder of service contract 72 from the Philippine government to extract gas in Reed Bank. That commercial agreement would have been vetted by, the Philipp by Philippine and Chinese officials. Unfortunately, COVID the COVID-19 pandemic aborted the meeting in Manila and no new meeting has been scheduled to date. In the meantime, the Philippines has lifted the moratorium on exploration activities in Reed Bank. The Chinese response has been very encouraging. China stated that it will not stop the exploration activities of the Philippines in Reed Bank because China and the Philippines have arrived at a consensus on the matter referring to the MOU and TOR. This is very unlike the Chinese reaction to Vietnamese and Malaysian exploration activities in the latter's EEZ in the South China Sea. The MOU and TOR arrangement will satisfy the objective of the Philippines to preserve its sovereign rights in its EEZ in the West Philippine Sea while allowing China through its state-owned enterprise Sinuk and Sinuk's partners to get 40% of the net proceeds of the gas in Reed Bank. It will be a fair and just arrangement satisfying China's objective of a win-win solution in the South China Sea dispute. The same MOU and TOR will expectedly be offered by China to Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia. If China pursues and sticks to the MOU and TOR arrangement, the maritime dispute in the entire South China Sea will be settled peacefully to the satisfaction of all disputant states. The soft admission by China that the Philippines is an EEZ in the West Philippine Sea will resolve the dispute between China on one side and the US and its allies on the other side on freedom of navigation and overflight in the West Philippine Sea. The Philippines will not object 
to the freedom of navigation and overflight operations, including naval drills, the US and its allies in the West Philippine Sea. The same scenario will most likely arise in the EEZs of Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia once these countries have their own MAU, MOU, and TOR, TOR arrangement with China. Since freedom of navigation and overflight operations, including naval drills, be, will be recognized in the EEZs of all ASEAN coastal states, there will be no need for the US and its allies to conduct freedom of navigation and operation overflight operations in these EEZs once every 45 days as they are doing now. They can go back to conducting freedom of navigation and overflight operations once or at most twice a year in these EEZs as they used to in the past. This will return the South China Sea to the situation before China started to aggressively enforce its claim under the Nine Dash Line. The bottom line is the obvious solution to the South China Sea dispute is the adherence by all coastal states in the South China Sea to the provisions of UNCLOS to which all disputant states are parties. If every state will respect the EEZ of every other state as prescribed under UNCLOS, the South China Sea will become a sea of peace and stability in our planet. Thank you and a good day to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Justice you. Scarpio. Thank you, everybody. Have a good lunch. <laughs> good Thank you for joining us in our session three. See you tomorrow for session four on governance. Mm -hmm.